Ladies and gentlemen, good day, and welcome to the i for good webinar series. My name is Stefano Polidori from the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, and I have the privilege of introducing today's webinar. The ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for the ICT, and we are also the organizers of the i for good in partnership with 40 UN sister agencies and co-convened with Switzerland. The goal of the AI for Good is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the UN Sustainable Development Goals and scale the solutions for global impact. In this framework, we are pleased today to discuss in-service monitoring and reporting for automated driving safety. We have a distinguished set of panelists today, but as always, we are counting on you, the participants, to help create an engaging discussion. Regardless if you join through the Zoom webinar or the neural network, please submit your questions at any time by typing the question in the dedicated chat box. Please note that the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the web page of the event. Today's webinar is organized in partnership with the ITU focus group on AI for autonomous and assisted driving. All presentations will be made available on the website of the focus group. Without further ado, I would like to welcome Mr. Brim Balcombe, the chairman of the ITU focus group on AI for autonomous and assisted driving to be our moderator of today's session. Over to you, Brim. Thank you very much, Stefano. It's a, a pleasure to be here. And as you say, we have an amazing lineup of speakers and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, as Stefano mentioned, the topic we've chosen for today's uh, workshop is in-service monitoring and reporting for automated driving safety. Um, as we approach the deployment of automated vehicles, it's been very interesting to see that the shift in narrative or the sort of a supplementing of the narrative, let's say, when we start to think about how safe is safe enough. It's a question that the AV industry has been dealing with uh, for the last five years. I would say for the last two, various different groups have been focusing on not just how safe is safe enough for deployment, you know, effectively like the driving license that a human driver needs to, to, uh, to acquire before driving on the road, but then how safe is safe enough while these vehicles are operating on the road. So more of the oversight that you might get from a local authority, from a police agency, or even from an insurer. How are we continuing to assure that the driver we approved was safe remains safe while acting on the road. So that's really what the, the topic we'll be focusing on today. Um, how do we use in-service monitoring to build trust? How do we use in-service monitoring to build a no-blame safety culture of continual improvement of this software? And then what evidence might be required by an in-use regulator for the purposes of, of, of sanctioning or uh, compliance for uh, the automated driving systems, should there be any issues that occur in the future. And so I'm delighted to say that we have some speakers representing uh, UNECE and the activities that have taken place within the GRVA forum. Um, we have speakers, uh, similar speakers, the same speakers from European Commission as well, which will be able to talk to the uh, recent draft regulation that was published from there. Um, we have speakers from the UK government, 
Centre for Connected and Autonomous Vehicles, as well as researchers uh, from TRL and safety. Uh, we have Marcus Nolte as well, representing uh, the VVM project with a manufacturer's view. And then towards the end, we'll have a presentation from Sadafra at WMG, focusing on how do we take rules of the road, whether that's the conventions on road traffic or uh, national highway code rules, and, and use those as a basis for monitoring, you know, to ensure compliance to those rules. So um, without further ado, I, I'd really like to introduce you to Christina Galassi, and then she'll be followed by Espedito Ruschiano, uh, who will talk about the UNECE activities that have been taking place most recently. So over to you, Christina. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice introduction, Brian, and thank you for inviting me. And a good day to everyone. Uh, indeed, as you mentioned today, I will uh, give an introduction both on uh, the UNEC VMAT uh, work on in service monitoring reporting, and then also on how this has been uh, indeed uh, uh, included in the new EU uh, regulation for uh, the type approval of automated driving system. Uh, so I will now share my presentation. I hope you can see the slides. It's just loading now. So we can see the slides if you want to put them full screen. Christina, that would be great. Yes. Okay, Perfect. should be full screen now. That's fantastic. Okay, so first of all, I would like to introduce you where we are placed. Uh, so in 2018, uh, the World Forum for Harmonization of Vehicle Regulations, WP29, established the Working Party on Automated and Connected Vehicles, GRVA. <coughs> Sorry, GRVA. And under this Working Party, several informal working groups uh, were also created, dealing with several aspects uh, related to uh, uh, driving automation, starting from functional requirements, so FRAV uh, working group, uh, then validation methods, VMAT, uh, then uh, EDR and the SSCD working group dealing with um, data recording uh, on board the vehicle. Uh, then the special interest group on regulation 157 uh, dealing with the um, amendment of uh, the uh, well-known automated lane keeping system regulation. Uh, to extend its scope also to lane change and uh, high speed. And then task force uh, for assisted uh, driver, uh, so advanced driver assistance systems. So these are not all the informal working groups, but are the ones where as a European Commission Joint Research Center, we are actively contributing and that are also relevant uh, to the discussion on in-service monitoring and reporting. So in particular, uh, in service monitoring reporting, you will see has been established as uh, one of the pillars of the multi-pillar approach developed by VMAT. Uh, so VMAT uh, indeed uh, um, subdivided its work uh, under four uh, subgroups uh, with the aim of defining the so-called multi-pillar approach for validation methods uh, of automated driving. So this multiple approach, uh, indeed, as you will see in the next slides, uh, will also include scenarios uh, that is then tasked to one of the subgroups, uh, but then also simulation and virtual testing, which is the aim of subgroup two. Uh, and then other two pillars are the audit and assessment and in-service monitoring reporting, which are covered under subgroup three. And finally, physical testing, both on track and in real world, covered by subgroup four. So here, of course, I'm, I'm uh, um, here to present today the uh, work together with Espedito of subgroup three uh, that has uh, been established and uh, led by uh, European Commission so far. So, uh, first of all, I would also like to mention uh, the deliverables uh, uh, so far released by VMAT. Uh, so you will find already available online on the uh, GRVA uh, and UNEC wiki page uh, the ATM master document, which is a document describing the new assessment and test method for automated driving. Uh, 
so in this document, uh, the first version was released uh, already last year, and then a second iteration was released this year. Both are published, and here you find the links. Uh, so in this document, the multipillar approach is described uh, into the details. Uh, so you will find the first introduction on the background on the need to uh, combine uh, different approaches for validating uh, the automated vehicle safety. And you will find description of the concept of the pillars. Uh, and for each pillar, also the strengths and weaknesses have been highlighted in this document, as well as also the need for further development compared to the uh, maturity of the pillar at that time. Uh, then building on this document, VMAT worked on the, uh, guidelines. So here you will find again the link to the draft guidelines and the new version will be available, I think, in the next days uh, for the upcoming GRBA session next week. So in these guidelines, uh, you will find, uh, again, the work related to the multipillar approach, but with more practical guidance on the implementation of the pillars and on the links between the uh, pillars themselves. Um, so uh, again, on one side, you will find the general concepts uh, in the master document, and then you will find more into the details what the pillars are about and uh, uh, what they will cover and how they can be uh, uh, implemented uh, more into the details in the guidelines. So here you can find in this sketch uh, a description of the full multipillar approach. So on one side, we have the, the operational design domain defined by the manufacturer, and then also the requirements uh, that are set by regulators. And then the question was, how can we uh, assess that indeed the uh, automated driving vehicle is compliant with the requirements? Of course, we also have to consider uh, the limitations of its operational design domain. And so based on that, a fundamental element of the multipillar approach, even if it's not the pillar itself, is this scenario catalog that will represent the common framework between manufacturer and regulators for the definition of those situations that are fundamental for the operation of the automated vehicle. So uh, then uh, the first pillar will be the uh, audit pillar, but indeed this includes both uh, um, the audit of the safety management system of the manufacturer and the safety assessment of the automated driving system. And I will uh, spend a few words on that in the next slides. Then we have a second pillar, the, um, uh, sorry, the second pillar, the uh, test methods. And in particular, we have the simulations, which also include virtual testing. And then we have the other pillars related to track testing and real-world testing. Of course, we expect that real-world testing will be the last step uh, to be performed only in safe conditions once we are um, um, pretty uh, aware and knowledgeable about the uh, performance level of performance of the vehicle. Uh, then. Uh, from here, we expect that all of this uh, assessment can happen before the market introduction. After the market inter introduction, we understood, and this is also a best practice that we took on board from other uh, fields, other trans transport fields, but not only from transport, uh, the in-service monitoring reporting will come. So we understood that indeed, as uh, Rian was mentioning before, uh, the assessment of the safety level of the ADS will not stop before market introduction, but will have to be monitored also afterwards. And this is the last pillar of NETM approach. So uh, just to say a few more words on the uh, three aspects that are covered by SG3, the subgroup three of VMAN. So the first uh, uh, aspect is related to the process audit, which indeed aims at verifying the maturity of the manufacturer's processes related to safety. So these uh, processes will be part of a safety management system here you can see on the right hand side uh, an example of the aspects covered by uh, the safety management, si safety management system as uh, suggested by the guidelines released by European Railway Agency. But most of those aspects are of general validity and could be applicable easily also to the automotive sector. 
And then, uh, of course, it's not fundamental just to have a safety management system, but also to uh, correctly and thoroughly implement it. Uh, uh, and in case the modifications are needed, also to properly manage changes. So this uh, audit of the safety management system uh, relates to the corporate safety culture, so to the manufacturer's activities, but also the way safety is managed by their personnel. And then the next uh, aspect covered by SG3 work is the safety assessment. So this assessment indeed will um, uh, aim at evaluating the safety concept, so the compliance of the safety concept uh, with the legislative requirements. Uh, it will also aim to assess that the safety concept has been correctly implemented into the design. <coughs> Sorry and has been validated, <coughs> sorry again, and it has been validated through uh, the pillars that we saw before, uh, virtual uh, testing and simulation, but also track and real world testing. And all of that has to be correctly documented. So we expect that a kind of safety analysis reports will be delivered by the manufacturer to the authority for this uh, assessment and will contain uh, the description of uh, the system uh, and also of the validation uh, process performed. So uh, finally, the last aspect covered by SG3 is indeed in-service management reporting. I have to say it took us a while to have this accepted as a pillar of an ATM approach because um, in, with difference compared to the other pillars, this is something that will happen after market introduction. And as you have might noticed from uh, uh, the definition of the scope of VMAT in the, in the first slide, uh, this aspect was not uh, covered, so it was not in the mandate from GRVA to VMAT. But indeed, I think we found uh, enough uh, good enough argumentation for this to be included as a pillar. So our point was what will happen. So as uh, in a in, uh, in discussion going in uh, ITU focus group, what will happen if there are accidents involving automated vehicles? So is, uh, we know that the vehicles will be equipped with EDR, so event data recorder and the SSAD, so data storage system for automated driving. But will that be enough to understand what happened and why, and who will have access to those information. So uh, maybe we need something more. And as I said, we look to other fields and we understood that learning from in-service data is uh, fundamental for the improvement of the technology and of the regulation, because this is the only way to close the improvement feedback loop through the operational experience feedback. And further to that, another important thing that we understood is that it will be fundamental not to stop there, but also to share uh, the relevant lessons learned. So here you can find this guiding principle for the aviation from the aviation sector. Safety is, of course, a global concern, and its improvement should not be limited by geographical or organizational borders. So this is exactly why in this in-service monitoring and reporting framework, as you will see, we are also uh, proposing and suggesting uh, a certain level of sharing between the authorities, between uh, also the manufacturers, and uh, possibly not just at the uh, local level, but also worldwide. And uh, Espedito will uh, tell you more about that. And here you can see indeed uh, the difference between what will happen before and after market introduction, as mentioned uh, earlier concerning the NATM approach and the three objectives of in-service monitoring reporting. So as I said, we want to learn uh, from uh, what is happening uh, in real life. We also want to identify risks uh, in need of immediate remedy and anomalies compared to the safety assessment performed before market introduction. So we want, in this sense, a confirmation of the safety level of the ADS. But the collection of data from operation can also help uh, manufacturers and authorities to identify new, unknown, and unsafe scenarios. So those situations that were not considered before as relevant for the validation and verification of the system, because maybe they were not there yet, huh? so they've been introduced by 
and driving automation in real, in real world, or because we believe that they were not relevant for the system since they were not relevant for, for the human driver. But it could be that it did something straightforward for a human driver, like, for example, uh, someone, uh, a person dressed like a chicken <laughs> at carnival is not straightforward for an automated driving system. So we also need to continuously update uh, this scenario's database and in service monitoring reporting can indeed have uh, feeding the new scenarios into the catalog. And then last but not least, as I mentioned, we want to share relevant lessons learned. And this can happen in the form of safety recommendations. Of course, we do not expect manufacturers to share all the data that they collect, but we would like to build a process, a framework, where this uh, data, this information is analyzed, elaborated, and shared in the form of safety recommendations, similarly to what is done in other fields. And this brings me to the end of my uh, first presentation. And I will now uh, wait for your questions. Super, Christina, that's really a really good overview. Would you like to continue with Espedito now? And then we'll take questions at the end once he's presented in more detail. Would that oh, be OK? Of course. I think that yeah, could be okay. a, a good approach as well. <laughs> Excellent. Thank so es Espedito, I'd like to invite you to the floor if you could uh, bring up your presentation and we can go into some more detail ab about the work. But it's a really good framework and I really appreciate the, uh, the insights, Christine. That's been great. Yeah. First of all, I mean, good day to everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm Espedito Luciano. I'm working for the Dutch Vehicle Authority, but today I'm representing, I mean, the subgroup three of VMAT. Okay, the focus of today, the presentation of today will be on uh, in-service safety and how in the subgroup three of VMAD, we are trying to address, I mean, this topic, the safety during the operation. I would like to start with a brief introduction that is in line with what uh, uh, already was mentioned by Maria Cristina, the subgroup three. I mean, in the subgroup three is trying to develop, I mean, guidelines for VMAD in order to develop the new assessment and test method for autonomous driving. What is our focus? Our focus is mainly the audit of the safety management system and also the safety assessment of the ADS. But we are also working on developing guidelines for in-service monitoring and reporting. Briefly about the audit part, what are the main goals that we are trying to achieve for the audit? Basically, they are the audit, the development audit procedures, for the safety management system within an organization. So to be sure that all the process within an organization are robust enough in order to develop, uh, manufacture, and operate safely uh, an ADS system. And then we are also trying to develop the guidelines for audit and assessment of uh, the safety by design concept. So in, in practice, in order to be sure that uh, all the hazards of the ADS are identified, and the risks are properly addressed. Also developing, we're also developing audit and assessment procedure in order to demonstrate the safety of the ADS by using documentation coming from simulation to struck and work, uh, real world testing. And finally, the audit and assess, the audit, I mean, uh, sub, the subgroup tree is also trying to, or need to assure the complementarity between the different pillar in order to be sure that uh, the safety coverage is achieved. Let's move now to the in-service monitoring reporting. That is the main, I mean, purpose of this presentation. Mainly the in-service monitoring reporting cover the safety during the operation. So through the uh, data, we are going to, uh, or we would like, I mean, to assess if the autonomous driving system still continue to be safe or if there are new risks that must be addressed. Uh, but we also I mean uh, realize that uh, the data from the operation can also be used to improve the testing methodology, as well as to improve the interaction between the human and the vehicle, and even to improve the driver education. Another goal that we want to achieve is that uh, through the data, it will be possible to identify new situations that can lead to the creation of new scenarios, and then to feed the scenario catalog. 
that is going to be developed in the subgroup one of the event. And finally, there is also an overarching topic that is to uh, increase the overall level of safety of the ADS community. How? By sharing uh, information about accident and incident. But I would like to say that uh, we also realize that uh, the sharing of information can also be used to spread the safety benefit of the ADS. What is now is called the safety 2.0. Let's go now to the uh, in-service monitoring reporting more in the detail. We do think that uh, there are three main processes for the in-service monitoring reporting. There is the monitoring itself that cover the overall data collection analysis that a vehicle and an ADS manufacturer should do. And it's also encompassed to some extent the reporting and investigation because the reporting will cover just a subset of all the data that are collected, what we call occurrence. Now, let me say that for occurrence, we consider a safety relevant event. I will come later on the specific definition. Uh, and basically, with reporting, we're trying to cover critical and not critical occurrence. And finally, we have the investigation that cover only the critical occurrence. To make clear the difference and the reason why we think all three processes are important, I want to show now uh, a pictorial representation of this process. You can see that the monitoring for us is more a predictive and to some extent also proactive for some I mean, aspect process that will help to identify also trends, I mean, situations that are not uh, yet uh, uh, an occurrence or a safety event, but if they continue in that way, they can lead to uh, an unsafe situation. They can lead to an occurrence, to an unsafe event. And then we have the reporting that is mainly reactive, even if the reporting can be, in some cases, proactive, when we rely on safety recommendation about other vehicles. And finally, the investigation is poorly purely reactive, reactive. This is why, I mean, we think that all three processes must be, all three process must be in place in order to assure a safe deployment of the ADS on the road. I will try now to provide them in some detail about each of these uh, main processes, the monitoring. Okay, talking about the monitoring, I mean, for us, the monitoring is mainly linked to the uh, audit pillar. What I mean with that, that we expect that the manufacturer of the ADS uh, manufacturer will have in place process and procedure in order to describe how the uh, monitoring of, of uh, the data uh, from the operation are collected and analyzed. So we do expect that the manufacturer will set up a monitoring program in which describe the data collection analysis. And this should be, I mean, uh, this is beside, I mean, the, the ADR and the SSID. Basically, we do expect that there is a description of how the data are recorded, how the data are transferred, analyzed, uh, and how the data are processed. And uh, also including the possibility to use data from other sources, because we think this is really, really relevant and important in order to assure uh, the safety during the operation. What is important here is to clarify that uh, the monitoring for us is mainly a predictive and proactive tool that goes beyond the occurrence reporting and mainly try to identify trends and unsafe situations before they happen. Let me make an example about that, about the possible benefit of introducing the monitoring. I mean, first of all, on the left side, you can see one of the analysis that we think can be useful. I mean, we can monitoring, I mean, some specific parameters, we can understand and we can evaluate the possible drifting of the behavior. Let me make an example. If in an in in ADS system, level three system, we want to measure, for instance, uh, the time for the transfer of control, and we monitor over the time, we can evaluate whether or not there is a drifting from our expecting, I mean, behavior of transfer of control time and how it changed during the time. That way we can intervene before any kind of unsafe situation will happen. There is another possible benefit that is on the right side. It's about the near misses. With the near misses, we mean any kind of unplanned event that did not result in an injury, illness, but had the potential to do so. So basically, uh, everything can be to some extent considered a near misses. But what is important here is that, uh, according to several research, we know that uh, the near misses can be considered a sort of precursor of uh, more severe uh, events, safety events. 
then we do see the benefit of uh, collecting this information because we can prevent, I mean, a more severe situation. But there is also another consideration. It was also, I mean, something that we have uh, uh, also discussed in our uh, subgroup three uh, in Viva, that when we think about the near misses, we don't need just to highlight the, uh, the negative side of the near misses, but also the possible positive side, because the near misses can also provide evidence on the capability of the ABS of preventing, I mean, accident and incident. In particular, if we compare with the, the human in the same situation. But this is basically, I mean, what we are trying to cover now in the monitoring. Let me move now to the reporting, to in-service reporting. The in-service reporting is mainly linked to the concept of uh, uh, occurrence. This is why we call also occurrence reporting. What do we mean with occurrence? The occurrence refers to any kind of safety related event that involves the, uh, the system uh, that have an ADS that is engaged. In our subgroup, we have identified two categories of occurrence, the critical and the not critical occurrence. For the critical occurrence, we mean any kind of occurrence that happen when the ADS is engaged and for which uh, there is a, uh, at least that one person that suffer, suffers of an injury uh, that will require medical attention or the vehicle or other vehicles or uh, even stationary object sustain physical damage that will go beyond the specific threshold. And any vehicle involved will experience uh, an event, uh, an airbag deployment event. These are basically, I mean, what we consider critical events. Everything that is not a, a, a critical occurrence, everything that is not critical, any kind of safety related event will be considered not critical event. For instance, an operational interruption or maybe a failure of the system. And according to, I mean, our guidelines, we do expect that a vehicle manufacturer, an ABS manufacturer, will report both on critical and not critical occurrence. What is important here to highlight that the main purpose of the in-service reporting is not to attribute any kind of blame or liability, but it's just to learn from the uh, from these events in order to increase the overall level of safety. This is the main purpose of the in-service reporting. But then there are some questions to answer. First of all, what kind of reporting? And second, I mean, what occurrence must be reported? Let me start from the kind of reporting that we've identified that are mainly divided in two categories. The short-term reporting that, are, that can be considered sort of single occurrence reporting. When there are evidence that, uh, when the data provide evidence, that, there are, uh, the, that the ADS is posing an acceptable uh, safety risk. In that case, we expect that the ADS manufacturer will report within one month, and this is mainly for critical occurrence, or when there are some indication that the system is not meeting anymore uh, the safety requirement. We have also introduced another kind of reporting that is called the periodic reporting. Why? Because this is a, a different form of reporting. In that particular, for, with that particular I mean, reporting, we want to receive the data in the form of uh, aggregated data, for instance, according to specific metrics like uh, per hour operation. And this reporting should be uh, provided by the ADS manufacturer to the authority at least, I mean, once a year. An example of periodic reporting, and why, for what purpose uh, we do expect the periodic reporting is to uh, evaluate that there are no inconsistency. Uh, in terms of performance compared to the ones that were demonstrated before the market introduction. And also that the DS is still confirming, uh, the is still, still compliant to the performance requirements set by the regulation. And also to be sure that uh, all the safety performance issues are addressed. Let's move now to what are the occurrence to be reported. This is something that uh, I will say uh, can still, I mean, uh, be detailed, but currently we have identified four main categories. The category one is the uh, all the occurrences that are related to the DDT performance of the ADS, the capability of the ADS to perform the DDT. The category two is related to all occurrences that are linked to the human machine interaction. The category three covers the technical. Uh, 
occurrence, mainly the, the failure of maintenance aspect. And finally, the category four, it is related to the occurrence uh, linked to the uh, new situation, new scenarios. But it's basically mean that what we have covered till now. Let me now move to the last process, that is investigation. Here, the investigation, as already mentioned, focus on critical occurrence. And what now is important to mention that change also the main actor, that is not only, uh, it's, it's not anymore, I will say the ADS manufacturer, but will be an investigation body that is responsible to conduct an investigation and then to provide an investigation report and where is appropriate, also safety recommendation. Uh, also, I mean, what is the goal of the investigation? It's mainly the same goal that we want to achieve also within service reporting. That again, is not to attribute any kind of blame or liability, but just to learn from accidents and serious incident. But uh, these are mainly the, the processes that we think are important to be in place and what should be done in order to make effective, but how the in-service monitoring a reporting framework should look like. We do see, that uh, it will be important to have three layers. I will say the industry layer that uh, will be responsible to collect the data from the operation to analyze this data and to provide to the second layer that is more the national one, uh, to provide them I in mean, short term and periodic reporting. And then we have the national layer that will uh, have, should have in place a repository system where all these reports are collected and based on this report, uh, uh, we will, uh, the, the national layer who is responsible for the national layer should issue also safety recommendation and annual reports. I will go into detail, I mean, after this, uh, in the next slide. And finally, we do see also the importance of a supranational layer that will be important in order to share the information between countries and to enhance the effectiveness of the uh, in-service re uh, monitoring reporting. Let me focus just for a while uh, for the uh, national one, where we do see uh, two main, uh, I would say, uh, player. The safety authority, that can be, I mean, the enforcement or the approval authority, depending on the, uh, on the country, but mainly, the, uh, but if not, I mean, can provide recommendation to the uh, authority. It will be responsible. This is really important for the complete management of the in-service monitoring repository and should derive also safety recommendation and publish annual report. I mean, this annual report should be anonymized, but they are important to spread the overall uh, safety of the ADS. And then we have the investigation body that we do think should be an independent and partial body that will investigate on occurrence. And will issue, I mean, uh, uh, investigation report and safety recommendation. And the same as for the safety authority, we do expect an annual report uh, with all the evidence about the, uh, the investigation. But we also realize that uh, even with this framework, there is still something that uh, must be uh, uh, included, even if uh, it's, it's and it was not I mean, possible to address completely by us because it's uh, uh, not uh, in our mandate. But it's important uh, to uh, make clear that uh, is not uh, is also important to uh, include reporting from other sources because not everything can be collected in the vehicle and can be reported for instance uh, if we think about the infringement of the traffic rules they cannot be i mean collected by the vehicle and we need them I in the participation of other player like for instance i don't know the police officer they can help in order to identify this kind of occurrence and we do see as uh, already happened in other sector, the involvement of, of other uh, actors, like I mean, the, maybe the driver or the traffic manager, and so on. Let me make an example based on what we have seen uh, in other sector. Maybe this slide can be a little bit confused, but just make an example. This is an example from the uh, aviation. But just to make clear that uh, uh, an, F, an effective in-service monitoring will require probably, uh, for sure, I will say the interaction of, of uh, other player, not only the authority and the uh, ADS manufacturer, but as you can see, for instance, from the aviation, we have the green part that are the authority. We have, I mean, the design uh, approval holder and the production organization that are mainly the vehicle manufacturer, but then we have 
other additional player, and all the interaction between this player are already I mean, identified and also described. This is what uh, means, at least in aviation, the total system approach in order to improve the overall level of safety. There are also other considerations that uh, we have identified and we try to address. As already mentioned in one of the first slides, one of the goal is to uh, increase the overall, I would say, level of safety of the ADS through information sharing. So we came up with, uh, oh, we identified some recommendations in order to facilitate the dissemination of the lesson learned. But we, uh, in particular, uh, the dissemination of information between contracting parties and authorities at international level. This is why we think it's important this third layer, supranational layer, to share the information. But we also identify that from one side, we need to take in consideration the importance of the information sharing. But from the other side, it's also important to ensure the confidentiality, uh, the production, the protection of the source, and also, I mean, uh, of the confidential information that the OEM will, uh, uh, an OEM or a vehicle manufacturer uh, will uh, share to the authority. This is something that also need to take in consideration. And it's important also that uh, uh, all the sensitive safety information will be protected and will be used just for safety purposes, not for other purposes. We came up with some uh, uh, general guidance principle. For instance, that the safety authority will be in charge of uh, set up this confidential reporting scheme in order to assure that uh, uh, the security and that uh, the privacy of all information give uh, from the other side uh, access to the database, to the authority at least, and make sure that uh, the safety recommendation will be public, will be publicly accessible, but for sure with the, in a form of anonym, with some anonymization. Uh, let me just conclude about the next steps. Uh, what we think is important now to do. I mean, we think it's important to uh, work in the detail of the performance that must be monitored, the data that must be collected in the vehicle, and then the occurrence that must be uh, reported. I hope that this can be done uh, also. It's something that uh, should be done not only by the cyber tree, but also uh, in, co in cooperation with other uh, groups in Lima, then maybe probably also in cooperation with you. What we are trying to do now is starting from the ADS safety requirement that are developed in other uh, groups, moving from that and try to identify what performance must be measured and then when we identify the performance, we want to move to the uh, vehicle uh, data and the parameters that must be collected and the metrics and the threshold that we need to take in consideration for the in-service monitoring. And finally, moving to the occurrence that must be reported. This is, I mean, the steps that we think are important and must be uh, done in the next period. Uh, with that, I have concluded and uh, yes, um, thanks for, for your attention, and yeah, I'm hoping yes, that uh, you have enjoyed and open to your question. Thanks. Excellent. Espedito, Christina, that was a really good introduction um, to the work that UNEC has been doing and, and the overall framework behind in-service monitoring and reporting. Um, I, I, I was really interested in your last point, uh, Espedito, when we talk about the next, the next steps, because I do think that that uh, aligns with the work that we've been focusing on in the ITU focus group, which is around the type of vehicle data that needs to come out. And it's always been a little bit chicken and egg is kind of a, what, what do you need to answer? What data do you have or what data have you got? And therefore, what questions can you answer? So I think that's definitely uh, going to be an interesting area for discussion. And we'll have some of our later presenters will touch on that topic, for example. So that's going to be really interesting. Um, we had uh, two, two questions from the floor, one for uh, Christina, and it was in relation to, uh, I guess, how it in use monitoring then feeds into scenarios and then what happens with those scenarios. So the question was about, will we create and publish scenarios uh, of interest that would affect safety, along with a proposal for what would be considered a safe state for that scenario? So I think it's this capturing of scenarios from in use monitoring potentially. Uh, well, yes. Uh, if I can answer this question, uh, the answer would be uh, yes, work is in progress. In the sense that the first attempts <clears throat> to create uh, a kind of catalog has been already done within Vima as G1. 
specifically for what concern uh, the highway uh, use case. And this work has also been uh, transferred uh, at least partially to uh, the work of uh, the special interest group on uh, um, regulation 157. And so automated lane keeping system indeed will be operating in a motorway. And so the work done on scenarios was applicable there. Uh, so um, on this side, on the NEC side, we've been working on uh, the highway application. On the EU side, we've been working mainly on the urban environment. And so in the new uh, UADS regulation, you will find a set of scenarios um, meant to be the most relevant ones to be a verified type approval and where we also set some requirements. Uh, so, of course, this is just the first step, <laughs> uh, but this uh, uh, catalog is meant to be indeed publicly available mm -hmm. and it will represent just uh, the minimum baseline uh, as a common framework between manufacturers and uh, the authorities. So it doesn't mean that the manufacturer will have to test just those uh, this short list of scenarios, but of course, we expect them to check every and each uh, possible scenarios relevant to the safety performance update. Yes, on the other side, authorities can be sure that those fundamental scenarios will have been covered and they can be assessed also to have approval. So the work is in progress and hopefully we will continue and we will reach a situation where we have uh, indeed, indeed uh, um, a common catalog uh, where all the experts can can agree on. Perfect. I really appreciate that. And we had had a, a secondary question um, from uh, Shikar, which was more directed towards Espedito. It came up during that uh, your presentation, where you, where you showed the safety pyramid that you had for occurrences, and it's sort of a, the question and comment was. Um, ha have you done any work to align that safety pyramid to the to the work of ISO 26262, which focuses on you know, severity, controllability, and probability, and the sort of ASL D type or the ASL ratings? So, is there a mapping that you've done between those two, and do you think that would be beneficial in the future? Uh, yeah, I mean, I will say that uh, in the subgroup three, we haven't. Uh, uh, yet done, I mean, uh, this mapping, uh, because as already mentioned, uh, uh, we have currently identified, I mean, the occurrence according to the severity, but just uh, dividing into class of occurrence. I do think that maybe uh, in the future, where we are going to even to uh, provide more detail about also the categorization of the occurrence, it will be beneficial to link also to the ISO 26262. But uh, maybe uh, just to talk not only about the subgroup tree, but if I can link, for instance, for what we have done uh, in a similar way in the subgroup two for simulation, we have tried to use for the categorization of the uh, simulation, the ISO 262 in order I mean, to identify the, uh, the level of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, to use the same categories of, two, of the of the 26262 and to be more aligned. But yes, this is something that, uh, yes, for sure in the future, if we will be able to provide more detail about the different classes of occurrence, something that uh, we can do. Excellent. I really appreciate that. And um, Christina, just going back. Can I may add something here? Uh, yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, uh, so actually at GRC, we are um, working a bit in, the, in that direction in the sense that we are um, uh, trying to set up a methodologies to define the risk related to the different scenarios. And this too uh, is linked to um, a requirement uh, included in the new uh, UADS regulation, where we are also addressing safety as, as a threshold. So if we set a threshold for, for example, fatality rate or injuries or any other global threshold, we will need a methodology that can be used by a manufacturer to demonstrate that this threshold is met before market introduction. And therefore, we are trying to develop a methodology where indeed for each scenarios or each uh, category or class of scenarios, we can assign uh, the severity and uh, an estimate if values are not available of the exposure. And this combination will give us the risk and will help us with this demonstration. And of course, uh, I wanted to mention that this in-service monitor reporting, 
then we'll also have the additional role of confirming that this threshold is not exceeded also in the reality, not just in the uh, evaluation before market introduction. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, that's really good. And then I just, I found it really interesting that you have a good, in the, in the framework being proposed by uh, UNEC, as well as what you're going on to talk about in a moment, which is with the European Commission, there seems to be a, a good flexibility between manufacturers being able to define safety themselves, while also having regulators that define minimum thresholds for safety. So if you want to talk about that a little bit, because obviously you're trying to leverage the expertise of the manufacturers and their knowledge that they're gaining, and in-service monitoring can be that link between that knowledge and then what the regulator needs to, needs to do to keep increasing safety. So I think it's a very interesting approach. Yes, exactly, because as you mentioned, we are dealing with very complex systems, so we need to be flexible. We cannot think about applying the, uh, <clears throat> the business as usual approach for just uh, testing the vehicles and having very specific requirements for all the aspects. This is no more possible. So that's why we need a combination of different approaches, analytical and also physical testing, but also simulation and operational experience feedback. And indeed, the in-service monitoring reporting can be the link between giving specific requirements and giving, leaving more flexibility to the manufacturer. So in this sense, we understood that we cannot give requirements for all scenarios, but we expect that the overall result of driving automation will be an improvement of road safety. How can we make sure that this is reached? Of course, we can use in-service monitoring reporting as Espedito explained, not just to measure what happens, but also to be proactive and to prevent something bad from happening with the sharing of lessons learned and with the monitoring part. But then we are also asking manufacturers with a EU um, uh, regulation that this check is also done, at least at some extent, with assumptions, of course, before market introduction. So being sure that we are on the safe side. We are going to improve road safety, not to degrade it. Uh, yeah. Maria Cristina, if I just can add just one thing, we also mean uh, make clear the importance of the safety management system within an organization. So what you can call the safety by processes, that is really important. It's the starting point in order to be sure that everything will be developed and will be also manufactured and operated safely. I do think that is also something that is really important it's already, I mean, in the Implementing Act, also in the VMAT and already also in the LKS. But it's just to, yeah, to cover, I mean, the safety in different way, also including the process. Super. Yes. And I think we have um, one more question that's coming from the floor from Raphael. And it, would, it is, I think, starting to think if we're doing in-use monitoring and reporting, there's obviously going to be a, a requirement for storing of data. Um, and what are the considerations around storing uh, of data? So you, you mentioned earlier there are activities on the um, EDR, DSSAD side. But in, in this framework, there feels like there's an additional requirement for the manufacturer to store data relevant for this in-service monitoring and reporting. And the exact mechanism of storage and the type of storage device has yet to be defined. It's, on, it's the manufacturer's responsibility to do that, as far as I'm, I'm understanding so far. So if you'd like to make a comment on that, that would be great. Well, the RGSCD are black boxes on board the vehicle, and they will serve mainly to retrieve data in case of accidents and, can, and will be used by the authorities also to assign uh, blame and liability so for this legal process. In service monitoring reporting, as Espirito explained very well, it goes beyond uh, this uh, uh, liability part. So uh, the aim is to learn and to improve. So the storage of data shouldn't be necessarily on board the vehicle. You expect that the manufacturer stores, receives the data and stores the data where it's more useful to them. We understood that some manufacturers are already relying on uh, service providers to collect data and uh, process of at least the first processing of data and then receive relevant information. So, and this is already in place not only for um, 
driving automation, but we know that this is already being done for, for example, for electric vehicles. So uh, for mobility in general, to improve mobility services and so on and so forth. And so we can imagine that this could be the case also for the data related to the vehicle safety. And then I don't know if Espedito has uh, other ideas on that. No, no, I mean, you say everything. I mean, at least we try to be open on where to store, I mean, all the information that can be in the vehicle, outside of the vehicle. Super. Um, Christina, I wonder if, um, if you're okay with the agenda, because we have a time limitation with Jamie, is it possible that Jamie steps in and just provides a, a sort of a, a very short UK view, and then we'll go back to the European uh, view oh, and the work you've sure, done with VC? Course. Is that okay? Super. Jamie, are you, um, are you available at the moment? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me and see me. Um, let me just uh, bring up my slides. Um, right, hopefully that should be full screen for everyone. Yeah, that's coming through. Okay, thank you very much, Jamie. Really appreciate that. Perfect. Um, yes, yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamie Hodgson. I work in uh, the Centre for Connected Autonomous Vehicles, which is a, a policy unit in the UK government's Department for Transport. Uh, and we're responsible for um, coordinating uh, self-driving vehicle policy in, in the UK um, and also for developing legislation and, and regulatory policy. Um, and uh, I thought today I would just very briefly um, cover the, the, the work that we're doing um, overall on self-driving legislation, uh, but also picking up particularly on, on this concept of uh, what we are calling in-use regulation, but but is is often called in-use uh, monitoring, and, and obviously, um, colleagues from the European Commission have talked about um, the sort of same same kind of issue, um, but from from a slightly different perspective. So, uh, I think that the best place to start and to set the context is a lot of the UK government's thinking in this space has been informed by um, the the Law Commission's review. Uh, so, the Law Commission of England, Wales, and Scottish Law Commission are a part of government, um, but they are tasked with looking at how to reform the law um, in the UK and, and to make suggestions on, on legislative proposals. And they've been conducting a three to four year review of legislation for self-driving vehicles um, after the, the Centre for Connected Autonomous Vehicles asked them to. And they published their final report in January 2022, uh, and you can go and, and find it on, on the internet. Um, it largely consists of three formal consultations and, and quite an extensive bit of stakeholder engagement, which was both uh, domestic and international. And, and essentially their, their final report made uh, a, a 75 recommendations for a fully comprehensive regulatory framework for self-driving vehicles. And th there's kind of two parts to this. One is that um, uh, there will obviously need to be new primary legislation, what we call in the UK primary legislation, which is about setting out the principles um, and the sort of high level requirements. And then there'll be some more work that comes afterwards to deliver what we call secondary legislation, which is more where the detail um, uh, is set out. And I think the piece that's most relevant for, for this group today is, is recommendation 18, uh, which is part of chapter six in the final report. And it talks about a, a new piece of legislation setting out a new safety assurance scheme, um, which is, is ostensibly trying to do two different things. So one is to monitor the safety of vehicles that have been authorised, so self-driving vehicles that have been legally recognised as such. And the second is to investigate infractions. And I think this is quite an important point uh, for, for the UK, that in-use regulation, as we call it, in-use monitoring, in-service monitoring, however you like to call it, um, for us goes a bit beyond the, the technical reporting side and also is about establishing a, a system of accountability. Um, you may, if you're familiar with the Law Commission uh, report, you'll know that there's this proposal to create a new legal entity who is responsible for the safety of the vehicle. And the, the idea is that in-use regulation is, is a regulatory scheme by which um, the, the ASD is held, that, that organisation, sorry, is held to account um, for the behaviour of the, the, the system. Um, and that, that's a really important part of, of the Law Commission's recommendations. And um, you may have seen, if you pay attention, uh, although it was a bit hidden, but in what we call the Queen's speech, uh, which is where the Queen sets out uh, legislation coming forward in this session of Parliament, um, there was mention of self-driving vehicle provisions. And so our expectation is to bring forward legislation by the end of this year. And as I said, that will set out the primary legislation and then we will have the secondary legislation, that more detailed stuff that comes later. Um, and that will be subject to further consultation. Um, and um, 
yeah, the, the, the idea would be to, to sort of set out the principles beforehand and then and then come along with, with detail afterwards. So just moving on to what we call CAVPASS. Um, so ostensibly, this is a, an internal program of work by government about assuring the safety and security of self-driving vehicles. And it's composed of, of broadly six work streams, uh, one of which is vehicle approval, authorization, which is that, that new proposal by uh, the, the law commissions around uh, authorizing a vehicle to drive itself, so even once it's received technical approval, there is this uh, decision made as to whether the responsibilities of that uh, related to that vehicle could be changed so that the occupant is no longer responsible for the behavior of the system. Then we have concepts like safe use, enablers, trial, cybersecurity. You know, it's quite a lot of work going on there. Um, and Workstream 4 will be looking at this concept of in-use regulation. Um, and, and ostensibly, this is about um, being able to deliver a, a fully comprehensive regulatory framework by 2025. So I talked about the, the sort of high, high uh, level principles uh, coming forward soon, and then there will be work to develop the detail. And our intention in the UK government is to deliver that by 2025. And then finally, just to talk a little bit about a particular piece of work that, that's part of CAVPASS. Um, and uh, this, this work stream, that work stream one, which is looking at vehicle approval and in-service compliance, commissioned several projects, uh, one of which was looking at in-use monitoring uh, further, recognizing that it's a very important uh, piece of the overall framework. Um, and I believe that uh, uh, Siddhartha will be speaking a little bit more about this, as will Will Perrin. Um, and uh, generally exploring what, what we're talking about today, which is uh, what sort of information needs to be shared by organizations uh, delivering self-driving vehicles, um, and, um, and how can we make sure that that delivers a, a safe um, uh, set of vehicles for, for whatever country they're being deployed in? Um, and I'll leave the detail to, to Will and Siddhartha as they're much more knowledgeable than I am. Uh, but if you do have any questions, unfortunately, I have to dash off shortly. But if you've got any more questions, do just drop them in the chat and I'll be able to answer them either here or, or offline. Thanks very much. Excellent. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, Jamie, I'm just going to take a, a quick a quick look at, at the chat just to see if there's any uh, questions that have come through. Um, one second. I think there are a couple in there that are more generic. I just wanted to um, touch on, Jamie, how, how the alignment obviously between the UK activity, UNECE and then also European Commission, that there's a lot of liaison between all of those groups to it to assure that what you know what we put in place is a compatible in some ways with that international regulation but then we, there is a degree of flexibility within the uk if you'd like to speak to that a little bit yeah sure so i think this is um probably one of the most frequent questions is you know in the law commission's proposals um what does this mean for things like automated lane keeping system what does this mean for, for work done at a un level and and ostensibly i think it comes back to that accountability point that um in the UK, like any other jurisdiction, you know, we have um, uh, certain laws about responsibilities. And for self-driving vehicles, obviously, that, that um, uh, questions that, that general approach to responsibility, which is you can't, it, it seems unfair to hold the driver responsible for the behavior of a self-driving vehicle. And obviously, that, that's not unique to the UK. That's what every country is, is grappling with. But what the Law Commission's review does is it suggests a, a different way to approach responsibility to ensure that just as much as vehicles are safe, they're also, um, you know, they could be held accountable, if you like. The vehicles themselves can't, of course, but the organizations that deploy them can be. And I think that that's how it fits in with that wider international framework of that. You know, we, we, we are um, part of the automated lane keeping system work. And, and that's, you know, uh, sort of business as usual, if you like. What the law commissions have proposed is an extra layer that, that kind of sits on top, which is about ensuring that once vehicles are deployed on roads, um, the, the organizations that deploy them can be held responsible, but also that the drivers aren't unfairly prosecuted for the behavior of the, the system. Um, and it contributes to that overall um, creation of, of hopefully a, a no blame safety culture, whereby it's quite clear when people are responsible, when they're not, and when it's just something that, that requires um, further work to ensure that, that vehicles can be made safer over time. And um, so I think hopefully that sort of explains it a bit more, but but I would I would say it sort of complements a lot of the international work that's already ongoing. Yeah, and, and I think it's it's really interesting to, to point out those differences between the sort of the the, the criminal and the sort of regulatory sanctions. So uh, effectively yeah. that there's a there's a number of things that a human driver may be held criminally liable for that won't that won't necessarily apply to a self-driving uh, mm. uh, uh, developer. 
Um, however, there is a range of regulatory sanctions that could be imposed all the way from fines to suspension or withdrawal of license, which, which mm-hmm. gives that regulator some, some way of controlling that market and controlling that behaviour and assuring ongoing and continued safety. So it'd be good to speak to that because that extends a little bit on the work that the uh, European Commission are doing. I think it goes one step further mm. at the moment. Yeah, I, I, had meant, I had meant to mention that actually that, um, you know, part of this uh, this sort of meeting was all about how safe is safe enough. And I think one of the biggest challenges will be after an incident, how are the public reassured that the vehicle remains safe? Um, and if you don't know what happened or you're not able to penalise the right people, um, a single incident may well seriously undermine public confidence in self-driving vehicles. And we know that there will be incidents. Uh, you know, we can't avoid them happening because the world is a, is a chaotic place. Um, and ultimately, something will go wrong. And we've already seen sort of um, advanced driver assistance systems like Tesla's system uh, having issues. Um, and so I think the importance that we're attaching to Pune's regulation is that you're able to um, explain to the public um, why a vehicle remains safe even after an incident. But you can also reassure them that action has been taken to penalise the, the necessary people. And, and the, the regulatory sanctions that the Law Commission's proposed um, we're, we're very much around trying to encourage um, a no blame culture, as I talked about, in terms of applying compliance orders or informal warnings. But, but as you mentioned, Bryn, there's also this, this civil penalty, so essentially a fine. Um, and in the most extreme cases, where there's evidence that the developer misled or, or didn't disclose safety relevant information, then, then the commissions propose that they would have committed a criminal offence. Um, and that would apply to uh, what the commission's called the nominated manager. So it's uh, an individual in the organisation that that sort of ensures that the correct due diligence has been done, and, and they will have they will have a due diligence defence, of course. But ultimately, that's kind of the extreme end of this this sanctions framework to to really try and avoid um, organisations that that clearly know a lot more about how the the systems work than government from from potentially misleading government and and creating unsafe systems. And and the collection of that sort of data in use or in in service it provides evidence that, that can support a manufacturer's safety case you know they claimed one thing at the mm. front to get the approval the evidence captured in in the real world can be a, a positive enforcement of that safety case a little bit like christina was mentioned we often talk about the negative or report the failures yes. but actually it can <laughs> also be a, a tool in which manufacturers can demonstrate the improvements in safety that have been seen by these systems and evidence of that yeah, exactly. And, and I think the, the you know, we, we do tend to talk about the negative outcomes because that's what worries us the most. But I think being able to clearly set out um, expectations for, for developers ensures that they can align all their activities to the positive stuff, uh, such that we have evidence to, to um, show the public that actually, in fact, you know, even if there has been one single incident, um, overall self-driving vehicles are still safer. And I think the in-use reporting side of things plays a really important role in that. Um, absolutely. Excellent. So, Jamie, if, if you, I believe you have to go fairly, fairly shortly. If anyone has any additional okay. questions, if they could post them in the Q and A, and Jamie will pick those up. Um, and then, th- thanks very much. Really interesting insights from the UK and uh, Great Britain. There. Um, if we move back to Christina, if you're available, I think it'd be a nice contrast now to look at the the, the recent draft regulation that the European Commission had out there on consultation. I was, I was pleased to participate and provide some feedback into that. And uh, it'd be good if you could just talk a little bit about that in contrast to the UK's approach from that would be great. Sure, sure. Thank you for giving me back the floor. I will now share my slides again. I hope you can see the slides now. Yeah, I'm just waiting for those to go full screen. It's taking a bit. Okay. Yeah, perfect. So the second part of my presentation indeed is uh, a bit to introduce you to the new EU regulation for the approval of automated driving system. And by this, we mean uh, vehicles without a driver. So level four for driving automation. So uh, as you might be aware, the commission released uh, different communications in the last years, setting up its strategy 
on connectivity and automation. So uh, the commission vision is for this to go along together. So connectivity and automation to reach the objectives of safer and sustainable transport. And of course, here it's not listed, but we also have in 2019, uh, the release of the new general safety regulation that constitutes the legal basis for us to uh, develop technical measures for the approval of automated driving system. And that's what we have been working on in the last couple of years, still taking into account also the input from stakeholders and in particular from industry. So our questions was indeed um, to understand which kind of technologies are coming up, coming to the market. Uh, what is in need of immediate um, regulation? And that's why basically we focus on the uh, upcoming technology technologies, including taxis and shuttles, so robot taxis and shuttles in the urban environment, but also have to have applications for uh, motorway, uh, and then also automated valet parking. And this is indeed aiming at reaching the objective of zero fatalities, which is vision zero of um, uh, strategy of the European Commission. So we are trying to achieve this goal, working on two parallel work streams. So as I mentioned before, the EU work focused on level four vehicles, so shuttles, robot taxi, but also automated valet parking and hub to hub. And we introduced new concepts, including the uh, new assessment methods. And the uh, draft text of the regulation has been uh, uh, indeed submitted for a, a public consultation and which is now closed and will undergo review and will be ready uh, hopefully by July, according to the uh, roadmap given in the general safety regulation. On the other side, we work at UNEC level on levels two and three, and specifically we contributed to the amendment of regulation 100. So we, we contributed um, some years ago also to the release of uh, the first version of the regulation, and then we have been working the last two years on the amendment of Regulation 157. So this amendment will bring it to cover also lane change and high speed. So it will uh, now address the approval of um, uh, um, motorway autopilot. And then we are also uh, co-chairing the task force on the, uh, the new regulation for uh, advanced uh, driver assistance systems in the task force and the other task force. Uh, and we are also contributed, as I mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, on the work of uh, uh, VMAD and FRAV on the development of this uh, new approach for uh, of general validity for all uh, use cases, so all um, automation driving levels. So I would like to mention that in the new EU ADS regulation, we implemented innovative approaches, not only for the assessment method, which is in line with the concepts developed by VMAT and the multipillar approach, but also for the safety requirements. And as also, as Pedito mentioned before, uh, we will, are not relying just on setting a, a, a global threshold for safety, but we are um, including uh, criteria, so acceptability criteria uh, for safety as a process, so for the uh, safety management system of the manufacturer that will also be audited and evaluated. And also we'll have also the concept uh, of safety as a measurement. So in this case, we set up we set up um, uh, requirements, specific requirements for specific use cases. So you will find requirements for uh, crossing, for example, where uh, indeed some uh, specific behavior from the automated driving system is expected and will be evaluated at that approval. And we adopted this approach of combining uh, different methodologies because we understood that indeed there is no uh, golden bullet. So just one approach uh, will have, of course, some advantages, but also some drawbacks that can be also only covered by combining all these approaches together. So as I mentioned before, for example, we uh, set up requirements for specific scenarios, but we cannot set up specific requirements for all the scenarios. And that's where the evaluation of the safety uh, processes, and uh, so the, the management of the safety through processes 
and the uh, setup of the global threshold uh, can help us to be sure that the situation will be under control also in the real world at global level so that the uh, result of uh, deployment of driving automation will be indeed road safety improvement and on the other side we have indeed uh, again the new assessment method uh, mirroring uh, what done in VMAT uh, and of which you have already heard before but I would like here also to introduce you uh, briefly a summary of the contents of the regulation. So we have, of course, the main text, and then the technical requirements are uh, described and set in the annexes. So we have Annex 1, uh, where the um, contents and the structure of the information document is set. So this information document is part of the documentation package that will have to be submitted by the manufacturer to the Top approval authority to comply with this uh, audit and assessment part. So under the safety assessment, this will be part of the documentation uh, submitted for the top approval, together with more detailed documentation and with um, privacy information, so proprietary information that should be made available at the manufacturer premises at least. So this information document will not contain uh, so detailed information, but will be used to show their relevant information with uh, also the other type of authorities. Then we have performance requirements in Annex 2, where requirements for specific um, traffic scenarios are set. And then uh, compliance, uh, so sorry, not only for specific traffic uh, scenarios, but indeed for uh, normal operation and emergency operation. So for uh, the uh, functional and the also um, normal operation of the vehicle. So you have for also requirements for the failure and you also have this uh, global threshold uh, mention. And then in Annex 3, instead, we have uh, the approach for compliance assessment. So this uh, method for verifying the safety level. And we have uh, a list of the traffic scenarios in part one. Then in part two, we have um, the description of the audit of the safety management system and the requirements. Uh, for documentation to be delivered, and again, the same for the safety assessment part. Then in part three, we have tests. So we have uh, a list of tests that uh, should be done on a track, and then also tests suggested for public road, of course, only in safe conditions and according to member states' uh, rules. Then in part four, we have guidelines for the credibility assessment that was also mentioned by Spirito before. And this refers to indeed the reliability uh, of the uh, simulation tool chains used. And so the validation of the tools and the reliability of their results. And then finally, in part five, we have uh, in-service monitoring reporting. So here indeed also linked with the audit of the safety management system, uh, we have the requirements for the manufacturer about reporting on uh, the occurrences. And I mentioned before that we published a draft version for the public consultation and here you can find the link to this uh, version of the draft text that was shared and so going a bit more into the detail for the in-service monitor reporting part uh, this is not as extensive as uh, the uh, work uh, released by sg3 in the new version of the vmat guidelines but is uh, still including the requirements for the reporting of the manufacturer so uh, according to two timing, the short term reporting and the periodic reporting. And there you will also find the list of occurrences that Espedito presented. So uh, the regulation at this stage does not go too much into the details of how this should happen, but that's uh, the, the state of the, of the work for the time being. Uh, and there is also a requirement for the manufacturer to share this information with the type approval authorities and also market surveillance authorities and the European Commission. So now we will be working on indeed how to establish at least at European level um, a, a common repository where this information can be stored and accessible to the authorities without the manufacturer having to uh, communicate everything to everyone um, all the times. And this indeed will also help in the analysis and consideration of those data and in deriving the safety recommendations to be then shared with stakeholders. 
And of course, the objectives of this exercise are the same as uh, stated previously by Espedito and my previous presentation. So, so we want to achieve safety confirmation, identify new scenarios, and then share the safety recommendations. And I think that's all from my side. Thank you. Perfect. I really, really appreciate that, uh, Christina. So um, just to be uh, clear, because the it's interesting with the language and level four, and I think when level four first got portrayed to the public, there was this idea of jumping in your own private vehicle and being able to sleep as it takes you from one place to another. Uh, but just to be clear, in the, in the current um, EU draft regulation, there's a requirement that if you switch from one mode to another, there's this idea of a dual mode or dual use vehicle. And um, that has to be done when the vehicle is stationary. So the idea that you could drive your own personal vehicle onto a motorway, press the level four button, fall asleep and get off at the other end isn't currently covered by that um, the draft regulation, as far as I understand. No, because we are not indeed covering this use case. So yeah. the, the use cases that are uh, covered, as I mentioned, are shuttles. So you are not in charge of activating or deactivating the uh, automated driving system. Uh, and then a robot taxi, again, you are a passenger, a user, not a driver. Um, and then hub to hub, in this case, we prescribe that this change uh, the switch from manual driving to uh, level four automated driving will happen when the vehicle is stationary. And we also prescribe tests for this and over. And then we have automatic ballot parking. Again, in this use case, you are driving your own vehicle, but then you will park the vehicle in a prescribed area and there there will be the takeover and then the vehicle will be driving by itself. So indeed this uh, um, application of uh, people sleeping in the car while the car is driving, in, in private cars at least, is not there yet. Also because as, uh, as from what we discussed uh, with the industry, uh, probably this will be a use case for uh, the next future, not just in the next years. Yeah, super. Um, I just have a, uh, we have one question from the floor, Christina, which was, was raised earlier, um, which says, well, when we speak about uh, threshold based on risk severity, detection and probability, are we establishing a relationship to RPN, which is risk priority number, which is a product of risk severity, detection and probability. So it's quite a specific question, but it's really to do with managing risk and how we make that assessment, really, I think. I have to say we are not there yet. So we are indeed um, looking at other fields. Um, to borrow methodologies and to see how those other methodologies can be applied also to the automotive sector, because this is something totally new for us. But we understood that this safety as a threshold approach, indeed, is a best practice applied in all the other sectors where safety has a central role. Uh, so, uh, for example, in aviation, they have it, railway, they have it, nuclear uh, reactor safety, they have it. So a global overview on the performance of the system is, is needed. And that's where we started from. Uh, I have to say that this concept was quite innovative, even if uh, already shared by um, uh, literature also in the automotive sector. So I can mention, for example, the Rand Corporation report, Safe Enough, which is indeed in line with the theme of our workshop today. And indeed, they suggest this combined approach and to include the safety as a threshold as uh, one of the criteria. So uh, I think we still need some uh, more discussion and some more time to develop our own approach uh, to that in the automotive sector for what concerns automated driving systems. But I'm confident that we will get there. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. And then we had an, a, another comment uh, from Rami, which was, I think, touching on the, the importance of black boxes. And, uh, it's, it's again, it's one of these terms that I think people understand because of the, the, the use of black boxes within aviation systems, even though they're yellow, uh, orange in, in their color. But the, the idea that the black box is capturing uh, the, the event and everything critical to defining the event and everything that you need to learn from that event. So it, in, in some ways, it would capture the scenario that was occurring. Um, and and she's just a... I think the question is just talk, talking about the, the need for a black box, mm -hmm. but maybe that that definition is currently 
extends where we are with the EDR and DSSAD. It goes a little bit beyond that in terms of the interactions that might be occurring inside the vehicle, outside the vehicle, or the types of data it's capturing for scenario definition. We certainly aren't currently captured within those two recording devices. Yes, I think I agree with what you mentioned. So we will have this kind of black boxes on the vehicle. We will have EDR and SSAD. EDR will be um, indeed implementing recording triggered by um, some, some thresholds in case of accidents. So they will record a few seconds immediately before and after an accident crash. Uh, while the SSAD will be continuously recording uh, basically some information, including uh, most of all who is driving, who is in charge, because it has been introduced for a uh, level three automated lane keeping system. So where the human driver and the system share the driving task. And so it is important to know, okay, an accident has occurred, but who was driving, the human or the system? But then I think also within the EDR, the working group, they understood that this will not be enough to uh, completely understand what happened. Or also there is the need to monitor some more operational aspects related to the ADS. And so this is also part of the ongoing discussion. And that's why as uh, Vima and SG3, we also uh, tried to link with the work ongoing there so that we can be aligned and we can understand if these systems can already record information relevant to the service monitoring reporting. Maybe not, not everything will be there. We understood that also for manufacturers, um, they will have access not to all relevant information to understand what happened during a crash, for example. They're not, they might not be able to detect what the vehicle didn't detect. Uh, for example, I think an example that uh, came from uh, uh, Jessica, from the, which only from the local mission, and she was uh, indeed really concerned about that, and I'm happy that she shared uh, uh, her ideas, is what if the vehicle just passed too close to a motorbike and let the motorbike fall? But then there, there's no uh, indeed triggering of the conditions to activate the EDR, so there will be no accident recorded, but then there will be indeed uh, uh, an accident. So how can we um, have access to this kind of information? Uh, th that's why we are trying to also involve other actors in the reporting and possibly also to have access to more information related to the vehicle from the infrastructure, from uh, the road authorities and so on and so forth. But this goes a bit beyond the VIMA, the SG3 mandate because we are dealing with the vehicle. So it's a bit uh, a limiting condition for us. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's very interesting because at a certain level of detail, it becomes quite proprietary to the system and the, the exact specifications of the system used for that driving system. And that's one of the things we've been focusing on in the ITU focus group is where to draw the line. You know, what, what could be the most common representation, the, the, the information that you need for informing new scenarios and what do you need to capture for that? Um, but still remaining a, a level below that, which is proprietary to the manufacturer and it becomes their responsibility to record. So but the thing that we've looked at is the definition of the world model, you know, the representation that's being used by the ADS for the world that it sees in front of it, you know, where it's located, what the other objects are, and what it perceives the risk to be, and therefore what mitigating action did it take. So the same tasks that human drivers tend to go through, but trying to limit the data to that, but maybe using that as a trigger that then the manufacturer can use to record any of the raw camera images or LIDAR or radar data that they feel they need to explain what happened and then provide justification for improvements to their systems and, and but leave that to the manufacturer definition. So that looks like a- That could be approach. a very effective approach. <laughs> yeah, super. Excellent. If there aren't any other uh, questions from the floor at the moment, I suggest we take a, a five minute break um, and then we'll come back and we'll have some more presentations uh, from Will, from Marcus and Sadafa, going into a little bit more detail about what, what type of data could be required, what the way manufacturers are thinking about that and how we could take uh, rules and codify those rules so we can look for compliance of behaviours to those rule sets. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, everyone. And we'll join you again at uh, 35 minutes past the hour.
Hello, welcome back to the ITU session on uh, in-service monitoring and reporting. Um, next up, we'll have a, a presenter, uh, Will Perrin from TRL, who's going to provide us some more insights into the work that the, U the research the UK government are currently undertaking in terms of in-use service, uh, in-use reporting. Um, I don't know, Will, are you available at the moment? Yes, yeah. I am. Hi, Bryn. Thanks for that. Super. I shall yeah. just share so my you, screen. Uh, yeah, you can bring up your presentation. I think that would be great. Can you see that? Yeah, that's come up. That's come up fine. So super. Thanks, Will. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, sorry, just some technical difficulties there. <laughs> Right, hopefully that's, st that's still working. Uh, so yeah, thank you everyone uh, for joining today. Uh, my name is Will Perrin. Uh, I work at TRL as a safety consultant and uh, TRL are a private research organization based in the UK, uh, working to forward sort of the safe deployment uh, of automated vehicles in the UK, among many other things. Uh, and as Bryn mentioned, we're supporting the Department for Transport in researching and developing a framework for uh, in-use monitoring and reporting within the, within Great Britain. Um, so it's the scheme that uh, Jamie was uh, discussing earlier. Uh, and really our main aim is, is to look at the sort of how we can develop a practical implementable scheme uh, for in-use monitoring to support that approval process. Uh, and as Jamie said, it, it's not just about the um, understanding and the technical monitoring. Uh, it's also about providing that accountability. So just as a quick disclaimer, um, this is obviously research uh, has been funded by the Department for Transport, but it is uh, pre-regulatory research and looking into the possible options for the framework. Um, so we're not necessarily, uh, the, the findings and recommendations that I'm going to talk about today are not necessarily uh, reflective of the views of the Department of Transport that they will take uh, when they come to look at future approval requirements. Um, but having said that, let's just talk through um, the work that we've been doing. Um, so I just wanted to put this into context of the, the Great Britain scheme, uh, as it were. Uh, th this is um, obviously approval for um, automation. And as Jamie said, that's a full sort of assurance scheme aiming to be ready by 2025. Um, having said that, there is we're sort of starting uh, off small and looking at an initial phase uh, of work. And the research that we're doing is going to support the news monitoring for that. So the initial phase of, phase of work is uh, low speed automated driving focus. Um, so initially focusing on low speed, largely urban environment use cases. Uh, and it will mainly be targeting vehicles uh, that provide a service rather than, than uh, private ownership of vehicles. Uh, so those services could be passenger services such as shuttle bus, robo taxi type operations as well as good services like last mile delivery. Um, we're, we're mainly looking at vehicles which are, uh, I suppose, non-standard in that they don't have uh, traditional human controls around steering wheels uh, and pedals, or they, they likely won't. Uh, and they will mainly be around sort of SAE level four automation. Uh, so in, in terms of the scope of the scheme, I think there, there will be four key roles involved, uh, as you can see here. So manufacturers, uh, there would be obviously developing vehicle, putting that for vehicle forward for approval, and then therefore responsible for that safe uh, operation, uh, the safe system uh, of that vehicle. Um, and therefore they would need to continue their um, safety assurance post deployment in line with the use monitoring requirements. Um, so therefore they'll be collecting data about vehicle performance and sharing that data to the regulator as needed. We then have the service operator who, uh, who can be a separate entity uh, and they are largely responsible for operating that vehicle and putting forward that deployment of that service uh, in question so a passenger a good service uh, and really they have responsible for this responsibility for that safe operation of the vehicle um, and will also have a role in in use monitoring as a result of that um, then we have the in use regulator uh, who are a new entity uh, proposed to be set up in the in the uk um, they would be providing oversight essentially on all AV operations within the scope of the approval scheme and therefore they'll be setting requirements on, on the manufacturers uh, and operators to collect and share that data and they'll be using that to assess compliance against uh, the scheme during use um, and as well as report on wider sort of 
GB safety performance for, for AVs and as well as investigating issues and intervening where necessary um, with sanctions to maintain safety. And then finally, we have the independent investigator. So they'll be looking at uh, more detailed blame free investigations for the generation of safety learning. So they'll be working quite closely with the news regulator uh, to investigate particular events uh, and develop uh, learnings for uh, improved safety that can be shared with the industry. So uh, just bringing into sort of the, the requirements of, of what this work is, is aiming to achieve. Um, similarly to the other presentations, we're, you know, we're believing that um, this sort of validation of the automated vehicle is continuous and should continue past during uh, past its deployment during operation. Um, so for that, the in-use monitoring serves broadly five purposes. So we have that we have that need to provide continued safety validation, uh, and in the context of approval, that's against the requirements and the evidence set out uh, by the manufacturer at approval. So that largely would be in the form of the safety case. So it's the arguments made in that safety case that we need to be assessing against, uh, and we also need to assess uh, and compare um, the the actual performance in the real world that it, that it achieved versus uh, what it managed to achieve through scenario testing and approval testing prior to deployment. We then need to want or have to look at monitoring uh, violations of behavioral rules. So obviously automated vehicles need to be uh, compliant with the rules of the road in the domestic uh, traffic rules within Great Britain. Uh, and for that, we have the highway code that sets out the guidance and requirements around that. So we really want to use in-use monitoring to ensure that uh, the AV is able to uh, operate in compliance with those traffic rules and we can identify any areas where those behavioural rules were not followed. Uh, one of the key uh, aims with this scheme were to identify um, hazards before any harm arises. Um, so we're really keen on taking a proactive approach uh, and to minimise the risk of AV operation uh, and intervene before uh, safety outcomes such as collisions are realised. So we don't want to wait for them to occur. This means that our in-use monitoring can't only look at collision events. We need to be looking at um, potential proxies that indicate higher risk behaviors or you know, subpar vehicle performance that we can then intervene and, and improve on uh, to minimize the risk to the public. And obviously one of the key things is we need to collect the data. So we obviously need to set out what that data looks like. And the data really needs to support uh, our learning and understanding of AV safety performance and uh, as expressed by the other presenters, it really needs to allow us to in investigate and understand what the causes of an event are um, so we can understand what the, the root cause is and take any remedial action. Uh, so we see the data is, is an input for not just uh, individual investigation of an occurrence or an event. Uh, we'll also be using that data to allow analysis of uh, trends to identify any con concerning trends around safety performance. And finally, the key aim is really to, the fifth key aim is to really support continual learning. Again, we think that there will be elements or, and gaps um, in the approval process that we set out initially. Um, and in-use monitoring can provide that feedback loop to then uh, allow uh, potentially more scenarios to be included into a scenario set uh, or new requirements on, uh, on the approval scheme that, that can improve safety through deployment. And also it's about sharing uh, those learnings across industry as well. So this sort of broadly sets out what our monitoring needs to do. Uh, we've, we're just going to show you now how uh, we propose uh, to, to provide that data and that monitoring. So as I said, the monitoring is really to identify um, and monitor against the validation of the safety case, looking at collisions and uh, near miss types of events, and really is also a focus on behavioural rule compliance. Now, our, our sort of ethos of, of monitoring has been based off of a sort of a data metrics and, and thresholds type approach. So data is collected on the vehicle um, to calculate a metric in real time. That metric then correlates to an increased safety risk. Uh, a good example would be something like harsh braking. Um, and then when that measured data exceeds some threshold value that we set, uh, we then log that as an event of interest and then the data is captured by the vehicle to support investigation. And we feel that sort of event-based data capture is really the, the only practical way to get that rich data surrounding the event 
uh, that allows you to investigate it to its cause and understand those causes uh, without capturing sort of unfeasible amounts of data were you to do that sort of continuously. So we split up those three, those, uh, those types of measures into uh, two sets, leading and lagging. Um, I just summarize what those are briefly. So lagging measures, measures strongly correlate to an actualized risk outcome. So they are uh, highly precise at identifying events um, such as collisions that we're, that we're obviously very interested in, uh, but they only cover events where the risk outcome has already occurred. Um, so they don't cover potential risk events or, or high or hazardous scenarios or, or high risk occurrences. Um, leading measures then, obviously on the other hand, are proxies. So they can ind indicate that there's potential increase in risk of a collision occurring. Um, that does not necessarily mean that there an, an event has occurred. So they are less precise than those lagging measures, but they also cover that wider range of possible risk events. Um, and we believe obviously that uh, we feel that there's a combination of leading and lagging measures are required uh, as a practical way of identifying events uh, and allowing sufficient data capture around those events for investigation. So here's a summary of the lagging and leading measures we proposed, so lagging on the left and leading on the right. And the aim was really to provide a set of measures that are based on data that we know is already being captured or can practically be captured. Uh, on an automated vehicle and obviously a, a, align with metrics that we can easily calculate on board the vehicle, as well as threshold value, values that we can set uh, reasonably easily. Um, so as well as collisions, um, the lagging measures were also intended to cover other risk events that we could expect. Um, as you can see there, there's other potential risk um, that, that could happen. So sort of a vehicle operating when the, the door is open, uh, could it indicate um, a passenger injury, for example. So we wanted to cover not just collisions, but other uh, risk events associated with operating a vehicle without, uh, without the driver that has those sort of responsibilities. Uh, and really the intent was to provide a set of measures that uh, provide coverage of a wide range of different risk events. So in developing these uh, measures, we also conducted a hazard analysis and risk assessment to identify all sort of reasonably foreseeable risk events uh, within the scope of the operations within the scheme. And then we looked at how uh, using that sort of low speed service operation as our use case, uh, what those risks would be, then mapped those to our set of measures uh, to, to identify uh, what the coverage of those um, measures would be to identify the reasonably foreseeable risk events. Uh, now, I do want to talk about that uh, in a little bit. I'll come on to talk about that in the next few slides. Um, but I did just want to talk about uh, the thresholds that we wanted to select for leading measures. So um, it, was, it, was, it became really clear while doing this work that while the measures themselves correlate with risk, ultimately it's the, the thresholds that you select that determine what is considered acceptably safe and what is considered unacceptably safe AV performance. Um, and this really ultimately comes down to the level of risk that we are prepared to accept for AVs and we're prepared to tolerate on the roads. It's obviously not an easy question to answer, um, but a, a useful starting point, I think, is um, the rules that we already have for human drivers. So where possible, we think that the thresholds should relate to established behavioural rules. Um, in the UK, obviously, we have the highway code and that sets uh, those, some of those requirements out. So, for example, we can take the rules around safe parceling of cyclists um, and in the highway code, there's guidance around uh, the passing distance that you need to provide when overtaking a cyclist. Um, so obviously, that, as you can see there, it's 1.5 metre clearance when overtaking a cyclist and that's at 30 mile an hour or less. However, there is a requirement at higher speeds that you need to leave a wider distance. So as you can see that there, this sets a sort of clear uh, threshold in terms of proximity between objects that we can then use as a uh, as a baseline for determining what's safe and unsafe uh, behavior. Um, but also as you can see that there is some difficulties in that, obviously that the, um, with that rule only there, that uh, the thresholds change with speed uh, and they also only apply when passing a cyclist for, for other uh, entities, for example, horse, horse riders, the, the passing distance is, is slightly different. Um, so obviously this, this shows us that the, the thresholds are dependent on the ODD elements. Uh, in this case, the, the speed and the type of road user, as well as the, the driving context as well. In this case, it's overtaking. 
whereas a, a distance from other road users in normal uh, driving, we say, uh, may be different. Uh, so it's clear that we can't develop universal thresholds. They need to be uh, context and ODD dependent. Um, and the other thing is we can't always rely on domestic traffic rules because they're not always as clearly defined as this scenario. Um, so to, to manage that, we found that simulation can then be sort of a powerful tool in developing those thresholds prior to deployment. So through simulation, we can analyze multiple scenarios and set a suitable fresh threshold that provides coverage of an acceptably high proportion of those events uh, and also minimizes the collection of false positives. Uh, however, obviously, it's important that we need uh, to constantly evaluate those thresholds throughout operations. So, and that's where in-use monitoring can come, come in as well to sort of self-reflect and provide feedback on its own performance uh, and determine the, uh, the value of those thresholds and refine those in the future. So then I want to talk about um, monitoring traffic rule compliance. This was something that we thought um, uh, as has been discussed previously, is very difficult to do and sits sort of outside leading and lagging measures. Um, because obviously traffic rules and uh, behavioral rules relate closely to that sort of driving context and the scene elements. And so it's very likely that the leading and lagging measures that we set are likely to be too broad to identify the exact nature of the sort of rules non-compliance that we're interested in. So as Bryn has uh, mentioned previously, our solution is to look at the that world model data and that aligns closely with the ITU focus group uh, work. And the aim is to compare the sort of actual behavior of the vehicle against its desired output in the situation. So we believe that the, the world model data that would need to be used is, is really around the sort of space and time data of objects and static elements in the scene. Uh, and by processing this data outside of the ADS, uh, we can compare the actual behavior of the vehicle against the desired performance. Uh, and as Bryn stated before, that can be then a trigger for more detailed uh, data collection to understand uh, the context and the uh, event causation. Um, and I said it's outside of the ADS that we process this data, but in, in practice, this can be done um, on board the vehicle, uh, off board the vehicle um, yeah, in real time or after the fact. However, the main advantage of doing it on board in real time is, as I said, we can use that as a method of identifying non-compliance events, which could then serve as a trigger for capture of that detailed event data. So um, one of the things that we, we found really clear is that if we wanted to use this sort of world model data for assessing rule compliance, then that sets requirements of what that information has to include. Um, so that world model data really needs to include elements of the scene that are relevant to those rules. Um, we can't assess compliance with those rule with the rules if the, uh, for example, with a adherence to a, a traffic light if the world model data doesn't include information about that traffic light and what state it was in, for example. So we really need to include uh, all of those elements that are relevant to those rules, so signs, markings, and other road users. Um, but one thing is really clear is that we found that this data is already in use. Uh, so you can see a visualization of the. Uh, what we would say is effectively world model data um, in the mobilized system in that picture there. And that's obviously uh, currently used for public and passenger assurance and, and insight into their system. Uh, but this is the exact same data that would be required to enable this type of monitoring. Um, and it's also the same data that would be needed to reconstruct collision scenarios um, to allow, enable that event investigation to take place, <clears throat> as well as generating uh, you would need this data to generate new scenarios um, if we wanted to improve our uh, set of scenarios that we'll be approving against. Um, so that, that's essentially our proposal for monitoring traffic rule compliance. Um, and I want to come back to just uh, the coverage of risk events. Um, so as I said, we did an assessment of uh, the coverage of risk events, and there are clearly some areas that cannot be captured um, with our monitoring approach. Um, and that we think this is essentially inevitable. We can't ensure 100% coverage of all uh, safety events because there's, um, as it's sort of too chaotic of a situation that we would, we would never be able to capture everything. Um, but in particular, our analysis has found that, um, as Christina was mentioning, perception failures relating to uh, non-detection of objects uh, can be a, are a clear uh, difficulty to identify. Uh, and obviously the sort of rule monitoring can provide some element of this, but there will be some perception failures um, 
that uh, will be difficult to monitor and, and capture data around. Um, so in order to maximize the coverage events, we also believe that there is a requirement for external mechanisms for event identification. Um, and we believe that there, there are already existing mechanisms that can already serve a part and, and input into this uh, in use monitoring process. So there are three um, external mechanisms that we think um, could be used currently. So we have uh, enforcement reports, so information from the police as well as local authorities around um, traffic infraction information, um, police reports of dangerous driving, etc. Um, through uh, through those reports, uh, a notice will be issued to the to the operator and manufacturer of that vehicle, um, which will then uh, be required to forward that report onto the regulator as well as any available data. And so that can serve as, an, uh, as a trigger to investigate an event uh, and, and capture all the available data. So that's police reports and enforcement reports. Similarly, we also have public reports. Um, so that would be a sort of a mechanism for uh, the public to report directly to the operator or manufacturer uh, as a way of um, identifying potential events. But it also can serve as uh, a mechanism uh, for public assurance and acceptance, I believe. Um, I think if, if there's an effective assurance of human oversight by allowing the public to report and have those reports actioned by um, the operator and the regulator, then that can provide uh, greater confidence that we're um, overseeing those vehicles um, and we're not just sort of leaving um, vehicles without a human operator to um, to operate by themselves with no oversight. So those are public reports and we believe that um, an operator should be required to set up a suitable mechanism to allow and collect those public reports and also feed those back. Uh, and finally, we also have um, operator processes. So as with current service operators, AV operators um, that are operating a service are expected to have a, a safety management system which underpins their operation. Uh, and as with current sort of systems um, for service operators that we think that will cover uh, requirements for vehicle checks, maintenance programs and inspections, uh, which may also identify elements of damage or performance failures uh, that could be indicative that a, a collision has occurred or there is a uh, high, uh, high risk of a future collision. So this could also input into um, into a news monitoring is again provides um, a trigger for event investigation um, and uh, obviously then a discussion with the regulator. Uh, so our, our findings really are that the, these processes already exist. Um, so it seems obvious really to allow those to interface with uh, in news monitoring and really increase our coverage of those risk events that we can identify. Obviously, there will still be elements of risk that we cannot identify, and hopefully, as we uh, learn and operate these vehicles, we can then start to close those gaps. But uh, at the moment, we believe that those external mechanisms can be uh, a real help in, in covering that. <clears throat> so finally, I just wanted to talk about data sharing. So we envisage that the frequency that the data is going to be shared to the regulator would be, would be varied with the type of data in the report. So we think that the manufacturer should report where there's any evidence, immediately report where there's any evidence is collected that invalidates those conditions made at approval. So this primarily means the safety case. So if there's any argument in the safety case that has been invalidated, which invalidates the safety of the, uh, the safety case, um, which was stated at, at the time of approval, um, then we think the manufacturer should, should immediately report that to the regulator for investigation. <clears throat> We also think that um, collisions should be reported immediately as well. Um, and this is to allow the regulator to initiate that investigation uh, and handle any media or public inquiries and really demonstrate again that, that level of oversight that we want to uh, ensure uh, to enable that sort of public acceptance. Other than that, we think that the data would be periodic. Um, and again, that's uh, around sort of six to 12 months. Um, and the, really the reports are there for sort of ensuring continuing compliance. Um, and as discussed before, it'd be great as well if that could ensure and, and evidence a safety benefit. Um, and really we want with those um, periodic reports, we're aiming for sort of an analysis of trends. 
So we'll be looking at um, you know, focus on trend analysis, uh, looking at longer term sort of evolution of risks. Um, so this may be through assessing trends in the rate of collisions or traffic infractions, or, or looking at which road user groups are uh, most affected by automated vehicle um, operation. So the trend analysis is really going to be looking at the aggregate data collected from individual event data from those leading and lagging measures as well as the other monitoring. Um, and then we think that we, uh, alongside that, to enable that trend analysis, the manufacturer would also have to report exposure data. <clears throat> so one of the things we found is that it can remain quite flexible. Um, so in an urban environment, we know that the accumulation of vehicle miles is going to be very difficult to achieve to enable um, the capture of that exposure data and then the assessment of statistical significance of, uh, of that safety performance uh, metric. So in an urban environment, it may be practical to use other exposure metrics, uh, things like uh, number of pedestrian interactions per, per mile, um, as then and then calculate the rate of occurrence of events in relation to those um, those metrics rather than vehicle miles. Um, but as I said, this is um, really open at the moment and trying to remain flexible in that regard. Um, so yeah, as I said, the, re the real aim is to um, for event investigation to identify any events that are um, that require further investigation, um, require um, any uh, intervention uh, by the regulator, as well as that trend analysis, which um, again is primarily aimed at ensuring continuous compli compliance and then uh, potentially a safety benefit as well. So just to summarize that process, we have sort of event level data. That data then gets sort of escalated for individual investigations, uh, or it can be aggregated for periodic reporting. The purpose of that event investigation and trend analysis is to identify any insights around safety performance. Uh, and this could indicate a few things. So this could identify where there is potentially a gap in the approval scheme, which could inform updates to those approval requirements, um, it, which can include the generation of new scenarios used for simulation testing or new, um, new requirements on, on approval. Um, those safety insights for a specific deployment may also identify areas where the, that specific manufacturer is not compliant with the current approval uh, or not compliant with their own safety case. And this, then this gives the regulator the option to intervene uh, with the application of sanctions, um, as Jamie discussed before. Uh, the Law Commission has set out uh, a list of several sanctions. Uh, and as you can see on the right there, they increase in uh, I suppose severity uh, depending on um, uh, the type of sanction issued. Uh, and the, the key findings with sanctions is that the regulator um, needs to be able to understand an event uh, to be able to uh, apply a just and, and fair sanction. Um, they need to be shown that the evidence that the cause of the event has been understood and that remedial action has been taken. Uh, uh, and I suppose in that way, the more information that the regulator has, then, then the fairer the sanctions will likely be. Without, it, uh, those sort of, without that information, there will be sort of a... Uh, a cautious approach adopted by the regulator, uh, where they may have to impose sanctions that are disproportionate but are, are necessary to reduce the risk due to that uncertainty um, in safety performance. So I think in that way, there's a really clear motivation for collecting information as part of in use monitoring, uh, under providing evidence to understand the causes of event, um, and then we can take sort of a just and fair approach, which. Um, hopefully will be part of that blame-free uh, safety culture. So that was everything I had to discuss. Uh, thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Back to you, Bryn. Excellent. Really, really appreciate that. Um, well, it was really comprehensive. I let you run over because I thought it, the content was really interesting, but, but that's kind of eaten into the question time. But oh, um, th th there's just a, a few things that have popped up. Uh, Michael Parsons raised an interesting point um, just which I think it'd be good to make a distinction on. Um, when we talk about in-service monitoring and reporting, mm. this isn't something that's actively engaged in the decision-making used by the autonomous vehicle. This is something that's just purely monitoring the behaviour of the vehicle. So if a sense of failure is identified, that is the responsibility of the autonomous vehicle developer in order to manage that and mitigate that 
And what, what comes from that might be a safety event that would then be reported. But the, the, the intent of this framework isn't to actually continually monitor the in use, if you like to say not the in use, but the uh, performance of the dynamic driving task and intervene in the performance of the dynamic driving task. No, I think it's about the outcomes. Uh, we're interested yeah. in, in identifying the outcomes and whether those outcomes had an impact on safety or indicated that a potential impact of safety could occur. And that's when the report, uh, that's when the regulator would need to, ex would expect a report from the manufacturer. Yeah, and, and then we have a couple of related questions from uh, Michael DS and from uh, Hugh Davies, yeah. um, which, which are when we, uh, let's say, when you have access to the world model, that's something that you can continually evaluate over time. So objects, you know, effectively looking at when an object appears, it, it may be that it was detected later than it would be expected or classified later as a pedestrian than expected. So there's an idea that it's a continual monitoring over that entire time period that would be valuable. Yeah, exactly. I think that's, that's where we can understand whether it took the right decision at the time or not we need to sort of look back into what its actual performance was and understand um, from the data we've got was it taking the right approach uh, was it uh, exhibiting safe behaviors and if there's any divergence there then that could trigger um, further event capture further event data capture that we can then use to investigate that event in more detail yeah and, and Hugh's point was just uh, just to focus on the, the sort of safety element uh, safety mm -hmm. envelope yeah. And a question around whether that safety envelope changes depending on the time and the situation. So, you know, for example, you mentioned passing distances is, is related to speed, also related to the object. And so there, there is this idea that that safety envelope is something that's dynamic and contextual. Yeah, I think I think so. I, I, I think I'd agree with that. I think it, it has to be contextual if we were to really uh, look at compliance with various situations in terms of uh, the rules of the road. Um, for example, uh, as well as sort of uh, correlation with safety. Um, there may be a very close proximity event, but the vehicle is stood still. Um, and in that case, that we're, we're not particularly interested in, in the safety event of that because the vehicle is not taking any action um, or, or less so at the very least. Um, whereas at, at higher speeds, a closer passing distance could uh, correlate to that. So I definitely agree that it is um, dynamic and contextual. I think um, we're looking at sort of a, um, time to collision proximity based approach um, where that speed based contextuality is built in um, so yeah I agree with that super and there's a, there's a couple of other questions from uh, Paul Barnard but if I could ask you to, to answer those in the text chat Will, sure. I think yeah, that would nice. be great and then we can proceed with um, with the next presentation from um, Marcus are you there Marcus Nalty thank you Super, thanks, Will. Okay, I can see Marcus coming up now. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Excellent. I can hear you well as well. Great. Um, perfect. That seems mm. to have come up fine, Marcus. So I look yeah. forward to your presentation. Thanks for giving us the insights. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bryn. Um, well, my name is Markus Nolte. I'm a, a research assistant at the Institute of Control Engineering at TU Braunschweig, Germany. And um, today I would like to give a short insight on aspects of in-service monitoring, how we see it in the verification and validation methods project, which is a project of the Pegasus project family in Germany. Um, we see this whole topic closely related to uh, the topics of assurance argumentation of the safety case. And so I want to give a very short insight on how we treat those topics as well and see how we can combine this in a certain way. Um, the slides are partially based on a presentation that me and my colleagues uh, have already given in German um, last year. So much of the credit also goes to them. Um, and yeah, I would like to start off with a very short motivation. It's something that we have already heard today. Um, we've already heard that um, automated vehicles are slowly but surely creeping into the market. We see that um, several players have offering have started offering um, services implemented by automated vehicles. Um, if you would like to call Waymo, for example, in Phoenix, uh, you can do so if you want to have your pizza delivered by Domino's uh, or by a neuro automated vehicle, you can do so as well. 
Um, but the large scale deployment of these systems that has been promised for, I think the last five years now is still not in place uh, as it has been um, promised. And one key reason that we see for that is of course safety because for these um, complex systems, safety is something that you need to build into the system. You cannot wrap it around after the fact. And um, how safe is safe enough? The motto of today's session is still somewhat not fully answered, um, I would say. And um, one project, at least in Germany, that, that set out to um, generate answers to the question how safe is safe enough was the Pegasus project back in 2016. And although Pegasus was very successful and although it answered already aspects of the question, um, when the project finished, um, we basically noticed that uh, there were still some things to do. Um, and so the Pegasus project family was instantiated um, currently with two successor projects, uh, which are set level four to five, a project that's more focused on simulation based testing. Um, and the project BNB Methods, um, the project that I'm talking about right now, um, which is focusing on methods, tool chains, um, specifications for um, verification and validation methods for automated driving systems. Um, and by the way, this project is even bigger than the original Pegasus project. So we knew what kind of answers or what kind of questions we still need to answer. Um, however, VV Methods is of course um, a continuation of the Pegasus journey. For those who are familiar um, with Pegasus, Pegasus basically was severely focusing on scenario-based testing. Um, that's what we do as well. We try to systematically control the test space um, of the open world by identifying which scenarios are actually relevant for verification and validation and how can we map the infinitely complex space of scenarios that can occur in the real world to those finite and manageable sets of artifacts that we are actually able to handle while being expressive enough to argue safety for the system. Um, as we have the big OEMs on board, as we have the tiers on board, we're also working on consistent interfaces um, for the methods that we're developing um, at an industry level so that we can have technical contracts and test of systems and exchangeable tool changes across the board. Um, and finally, also things that we have heard today, um, we are trying to shift testing significantly from simulation to, uh, fr from real world testing, excuse me, from real world testing to simulation, um, so that we do our due diligence and see what test cases need to be executed uh, in the real world and where we can resort to simulation. Um, one big addition compared to the original Pegasus project um, was a focus on the safety argument, on the safety case, on the assurance argument, um, on the safety case that we are actually that we should be able to build for the system. And this is not as simple as it may seem. Um, we have already heard the real world is very complex. The real world is chaotic, and uh, we refer to that uh, with a with a concept that we refer to as the open context, which basically means that that our systems have to um, work in the real world. Um, and with that, they are subject to a number of different uh, types of uncertainty. We're not sure where other traffic participants may be in one or two or two, three seconds time with measurement uncertainty uh, included, of course. We do not know exactly from the measurement readings where the things that we are supposed to see actually really are. Um, our developers have incomplete knowledge. Um, if there are things that we haven't seen before, um, we cannot include it in the system specification, of course, such as uh, new traffic participants that might come up, such as electric scooters. Um, and this inevitably leads to incomplete requirements, of course, um, because we cannot specify everything, every situation, every scenario beforehand. And with that, of course, there is uncertainty about the entire verification and validation process. And um, from all these uncertainties, from all these types of uncertainty, there is a certain risk involved that is exposed by the system, um, which is probably known to, um, to every one of us. And now we have the safety argument um, and the safety case. And here, the main task becomes to argue that the remaining risk that is exposed by the system is not unreasonable. So another question would be, how can we argue for the absence of unreasonable risk in this open context, in this chaotic world? Um, and surely enough, we must be able to argue this in a comprehensible manner for a variety of stakeholders. Um, it's not enough if 
um, the developers are content that the system is safe enough to release it to the public. Um, we have heard different perspectives already today, like from regulators, we need to explain to them why we think that the system is safe enough. We must explain it to the public, of course, because um, if we cannot make the general public understand why we think that the systems are safe enough, why should they use it? In other words, we need to foster the public trust in the technology via the safety argumentation. And one particular um, challenge that we have in this respect is that we're still lacking an exact interpretation of what this kind of reasonable really means. Is it enough if a system is one order or two orders of magnitude better than a human, while there is a certain type of accident that is occurring over and over again? Is that enough? Is that reasonable? Um, the connections that will just refer to between leading and lagging metrics might be unclear as well. Um, so there are a lot of different types of unknowns that we have when we need to argue for safety. Um, and to add to that, the word is not only chaotic, it also changes. Um, we know that the safety case that might be instantiated um, before the release of the product um, may not hold when the world change. And we must be aware of that, that this is the fact. We must be very aware of the um, fact that everything we do during the development is basically a collection of assumptions um, because we take the world, the operational domain, so to say, and step by step, we start breaking it down by interpreting law, by interpreting the real world into something um, that we call the operational design domain. We might say that our vehicles are only allowed to drive in certain places. We might say that our vehicles are only um, allowed to drive in certain weather conditions in certain days of uh, times of day. We might say that certain elements might not occur in this type of, of ODD. And with respect to the safety argumentation, um, in order to state that the system is safe, we think that it is very very, very important that we are able to trace these kinds of decompositions, these types of assumptions or interpretations that we make during the design process um, through the safety argument and make sure that we know why um, certain statements in the safety case are made. Um, and this also relates, of course, to the fact that we need to monitor these assumptions. We're talking about in-service monitoring nonetheless. Um, when we have deployed the systems, because um, it might be that something pops up um, after uh, the system has been released, which we had no chance of thinking about before, even though we did our due diligence on everything. There might be changes to the um, operational design domain that we might not have anticipated before, and we must be able to find these changes um, and avoid that these things um, void the safety case. This is basically what uh, today's uh, talk is about. Um, how we will capture this in our um, safety argument. This is something which I would refer to right now very quickly. And after that, I want to show, um, yeah, present some more details on the ideas that we have for a coherent in-service monitoring process. Um, our safety assurance or our uh, safety assurance case in VB methods is significantly significantly based on this, what we call the three circle model. I do not want to go into every detail um, of this model. Um, for those who are interested, I put the reference there. Um, you can read up on that uh, offline. Um, the most important thing is that we have um, a trinity of the things that we call required behavior, which would be the behavior that the system would need to show to be perfect. We have the specified behavior that would be the system specified 100% correctly, and we have the real behavior that would then be compliant to everything that we see in the real world. Um, of course, as I already introduced, we will never um, be able to have this, these three circles overlap to 100%. We will always have a specification gap. We will always have a gap in the implementation and we will always have, because of the specification gap and the implementation gap, we will always have a gap in the validation. The goal during development now is to get the overlap of the circles uh, as large as possible, while the task of the safety argument of the safety case is to argue why we think that despite the um, these areas that are marked here, um, that despite missing specification, despite wrong specification, and despite uh, um, the fact that the system might show unexpected behavior, why we think that the risk that is exposed by the system is not unreasonable. Um, and to be able to argue this, we have 
based our assurance framework on, on this kind of three circle model. Um, in other words, we try to argue that the system in its environment is specified and it, that it is, is verifiable and validatable sufficiently completely and correctly. Um, we want to be argued that the system is designed diligently, that it has been implemented diligently and that the verification and validation is performed to the best of our knowledge. And finally, we wanna be argued that the system is safe under uncontrollable real work conditions, um, basically going beyond the assumptions that we make during the, um, during the um, verification and validation inside the, um, the model work that we have when we're designing. So to say, we try to slice the elephant um, into three different parts and come up with an assurance framework that's, that is based on three layers, what we call the capability layer, the engineering layer, and the real world layer, um, where the capability layer is basically there to argue that the ADS has all the necessary capability to fulfill its mission um, in the operational design domain. The engineering layer is there to argue the due diligence in the, um, in the implementation and verification and validation process. And the real world layer is there to be able to put the system to the test, whether it is performing as intended. Um, and that of course is then the foundation for our assurance case. Um, and now we have the problem um, that we of course need to provide evidence in the assurance case um, and that we must ensure that the evidence that we get for the assurance case is not only provided once, but that we are able to continuously um, provide evidence of the safety of the system here. And this is um, where now our learning driven product life cycle um, comes in, um, which is a high level concept, I would say, for the things that we heard by Will, for the things that we heard by Christina, by the things that we heard by Espedito. Um, where we basically try to come up with um, processes that can deliver all these different th uh, requirements that we uh, have already heard today. Um, the processes are based on a four quadrant model um, where the upper half is representing the product development related processes. Um, the lower half um, is supposed to reflect the application of the product. So if we apply the automated driving system in real traffic, so to say. So the upper half, Q1, is focusing on, on the organization, on the processes, methods, tools um, that need to be instantiated in the organization um, to start the, de the development of the system. Um, Q2 is basically there to reflect the development of the, of the ADS system as a product. And finally, we have two systems in operation um, where we have the um, automated driving system that is operating in real traffic, where we have an evidence measurement system, if you want to call it that way. And uh, in the fourth quadrant, we basically have a um, evidence analysis system that can be deployed with the vehicle, that can be deployed in the back end. Um, we've already heard that by, by Will um, in the last talk. Um, and this is basically an iterative process, of course, where information is shared between the different quadrants, uh, between the different units in the organization, between the, uh, the different systems. Um, the organization is basically there to instantiate or to generate the rules um, to set up for the uh, development of the um, ADS. Um, the ADS is then developed according to those rules. Um, rules are, for example, when we look at the operational design domain, we analyze Q1 analyzes the operational design domain, Q2 um, performs implementation, builds models, gets parameters on how the operational design domain can be reflected in the design. Um, then, of course, we have you know, to do our due diligence, we have to um, basically make sure that the system is safe before we uh, introduce it into public traffic. Um, then we have a system that acts according to the rules that have been defined in Q2 um, in its ODD in public traffic. Um, and then of course, there might be violations of assumptions, there might be models that are not accurate. And for that, we need um, the type of uh, evidence recording systems that we have already heard about today. Um, and these systems then provide basically the collected data um, to some system that is able to, um, to analyze the data and generate um, and processes um, the, the according evidence here to provide feedback back to the organization which then is able to retrieve 
the different types of evidence and maybe adapt the rules for the system. And, or maybe if we suddenly notice that um, some severe central assumptions are violated that invalidate the safety case, would also maybe be able, uh, able would be responsible for grounding the fleet if it's that severe. Um, of course, these, uh, these processes uh, come with Disclaimers, of course, we must make sure that the automated driving system is proven safe at the time that it's placed into the market. We are not testing at the customer. We're not conducting beta testing here. Um, the monitoring can, of course, take place by a variety of paths, um, from simple accident data analysis uh, over the observation of traffic flows, so by external systems, but also by systems in the fleet and the sub fleet. And we must, of course, make sure that the monitoring is always compliant with security and privacy laws here. Um, all right, so here we can go a little more uh, into the details. This is an overview about the entire process. Um, and I wanna go through the four quadrants now step-by-step step for the different um, processes that we uh, think are appropriate for instantiating these kinds of, uh, of monitoring processes. Um, starting of course um, with Q1 with the uh, organization, basically, the first quadrant represents the organization's head. Um, so we get the normative claims, we get the requirements from the regulators, for example. Um, and of course, in the processes that are conducted there, um, we do make assumptions, we do make these kinds of decompositions that I referred to earlier. Um, and what we want to try to avoid with this reference process here is that these assumptions um, that these interpretations are just made implicitly. Um, because when you implement these systems, um, experienced developers have, of course, lots and lots of experience um, and lots and lots of implicit knowledge um, that might not be made explicit every time. So we want to focus here on the fact that we need to make the knowledge that the developers have explicit and derive the underlying assumptions. Because um, when it comes to monitoring, we only are able to monitor the things if we make them explicit. It's very difficult um, to monitor all these kinds of uh, implicit assumptions that could be um, yeah, implemented in the system design. Um, and of course, what we also need for the organization is to enable the feedback, um, the feedback loop here, um, where the organization must be able to evaluate different hypotheses regarding rules and models that might be provided by the anal analysis engines um, from the fourth quadrant, which we will see in a second. Coming to the second quadrant, um, we see two main um, lines of processes here. Um, on the one hand, of course, um, the engineers in the organization start implementing the system, um, often by applying rules, by, um, by designing models, by choosing parameters for those models. Um, and then of course, by turning all their findings that they make during the development into the product. Um, what we want to ensure here is that we use the information that we generate in the first quadrant where the assumptions um, shall be made explicit. For example, typical um, times to collisions, for example, that we are um, expected to see in certain scenarios um, to make that explicit and use this explicit information to um, explicitly design monitors um, for those assumptions so that we are able to deploy these monitors um, together with um, the actual automated driving systems into the field. Um, and of course here, um, these monitors are deployed uh, together or before system operation. And of course, the second quadrant always um, finishes with safeguarding activities, except for the fact if we have some, if we have things that do not um, actively interact with the automated driving system. We can think about shadowing systems, for example, that are just there in the background that do not actively influence um, the automated driving system itself, um, where we might just collect data to see how different algorithms might perform. Um, then going to the uh, third quadrant, this is basically where the um, automated driving system in its physical form um, is operating in its environment. So it applies 
basically it acts according to the rules, according to the models that the engineers have designed for it. Um, and by that, of course, it is one big sensor and it collect it, it, it can collect data um, that can serve as evidence um, how the system is actually performing uh, in the real world. Um, at the same time, of course, um, the monitors there then continuously uh, monitor the assumptions that we made during the development um, in the different kinds of scenario. Our distance is kept, for example. Um, we have heard um, actual implementations that are there um, that can be applied by Will in the previous talk. Um, and then basically we have one decision instance here where we basically try to um, yeah, limit the amount of data that is actually uh, fed to the evidence processing systems um, in order to keep bandwidth low and so on and so forth, so that we do not need to continuously monitor, but to set triggers when we need to start um, monitoring and when it is interesting to monitor the data. Um, and finally, in the fourth quadrant, um, this is the idea that we have some kind of some kind of um, more powerful processing agent that might be more powerful than the um, than the ADS itself, um, because it does not necessarily need to operate in real time. Um, so that we can take the evidence uh, that has been recorded in the field, evaluate it, um, compare it to a database, um, see whether, uh, see or try to find the reasons why the assumptions uh, that, uh, that we made during the development were violated. We come up with a hypothesis here and then um, start to circle all, all over again to enable the organization to, um, yeah, to react to uh, the things that we found in the real world. Um, that is basically just a very high level overview um, about how such a process might look like and how we uh, imagine the interaction of these kinds of processes with, um, with an actual safety case. Um, and what we have learned here is, of course, that the replacement of the human driver um, requires a shift of responsibility to cope with the open context. And this to a shift of responsibility also always shifts responsibility to the organization in some in some way. That is why we need this kind of dedicated learning process for the organization um, to actually yeah, go beyond what we currently have in, in terms of market observation quality management, because we are currently, I think we are too slow to react uh, here. We need to be orders of magnitude faster to, uh, yeah, to comply to the requirements that uh, automated driving systems may pose here. Um, then what we have seen was that the implementation of monitors, of course, is crucial here. Um, this shift of responsibility is only possible if we explicitly implement these monitors and instantiate them in order to refuse its assumptions or what we have uh, heard before, also maybe to confirm uh, assumptions. Uh, if we do, do not find any surprises in, in the real uh, in the fields in the real world, well, maybe that's an indicator that our system might be not too bad, too badly implemented. Um, the shadowing system is one example of such implemented monitors, of course, um, and the results that we get from the systems can then used to improve the system to, to yeah, basically have a positive contribution to a risk balance that might be required from those systems so that we can step-by-step step further improve the safety of those systems and nonetheless argue why we think that the systems are safe and why we think that they remain safe even under the aspects of a changing world. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please go ahead. Excellent. Marcus, that was fantastic. Really appreciate that contribution. Um, I was interested, you mentioned it, it briefly, the um, stakeholders within uh, the, the VVM project, the sort of manufacturers and the tier one suppliers providing sensors, equipment, compute to those manufacturers. If you just talk about the composition there, because it's, it's really interesting. We've obviously heard from regulators um, previously in, in our discussions and talks, and but it, there seems to be very close alignment with what manufacturers and tier one suppliers are thinking that they need to put in place for their to to, to, to validate their own safety cases and yes of course i mean you know how these uh, these research projects work there's always many parties uh, uh, involved and at some point you're kind of agreeing on uh, um, on the things that um, that everybody can agree on um, 
I must say that, that it is, of course, a controversial topic when it comes to monitoring and how we communicate that. Um, but what we see is that um, there is a strong proposition, of course, for these kind of uh, systems, because at least within um, the verification and validation methods project, um, we want to explicitly acknowledge the challenges that we have uh, when we interact with the open world. And um, if you ask me as a researcher, uh, personally, I think that these monitoring systems are the only way of, um, to, to actually make sure that the systems can stay safe because we must, we must make sure that if the context changes, that the systems stay safe. Yeah, and, and I think what was really um, in, interesting is that the, the, the specification of exactly what to monitor and how to monitor at the moment is being, is being left in the hands of the individual mm -hmm. manufacturers. So the, the overall framework and the mechanism is kind of like there's some agreement there, but the specifics become mm -hmm. sort of proprietary to the manufacturer or proprietary to the implementation of an ADS by that manufacturer. So yep. that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, um, I mean, that, that's the approach that we're following um, in the project because we cannot prescribe every manufacturer to do what they have to do. We try to focus on neuralgic points where we can say, yes, these are the things that are important and maybe we can find common ground on these and then um, yeah, leave the concrete implementation, um, of course, to the manufacturers themselves, but we need to make sure that we have defined interfaces um, and yeah, defined these neuralgic points that are important for the safety argument. And, yeah, and then I think it's very interesting with the flexibility, you know, being put into the European Commission framework or the UK framework is that there can then be a constant uh, evolution, if you like, of what that safe threshold might be. So that there, there may be things that become common mm -hmm. and so common that they're then included in regulation and then every manufacturer has to meet those. And the evidence they provide can kind of raise the, raise the tide if you like so all boats lift and safety improves for everybody yeah. but that's a, an iterative process that we're going to be entering yeah. into exactly yes perfect well I, I really appreciate your time uh there's i think one question in the chat if you wouldn't mind going over to the, mm -hmm. the text chat in order to answer that that would be that would be great and then we'll lead on to our final presenter which is uh Siddhartha from wmg Siddhartha, are you there yes i'm here Perfect. So not wanting to give away your talk, but Sadafa's work is really interesting in terms of looking at uh, rules, rules of the road, how they could be encoded and therefore being used uh, both uh, say in scenarios, but then also in service monitoring, how they could be monitored. So Sadafa, if you'd just like to explain the, the work that you've been doing there, that you've been feeding into the UK and also into uh, the European Commissions, uh, the uh, UNECE. Thank you. Thank you, Bryn. Uh, before Thank I you. start, just to check if you can see my screen in full screen. You can see your slide. We can see, though, the next slide note as well, though, at the moment. So, oh, not, okay. not the so it's like screen. we're in a presenter mode. Okay. Let me try this again. Hopefully that should be fine. Yeah, that looks like full screen there. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Bryn. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm Sadat Kastiki, as Bryn said. I'm going to talk to you about uh, defining safe behavior for automated driving systems. Uh, speakers before me, Marcus, Christina, and Will, and uh, Anaspirito would have talked a bit about uh, the need for defining safe behavior. And I'm going to talk about how we're actually going to do it. Uh, going beyond just saying uh, this needs to be done and how we're going to do it. Uh, and we're going to take a rules of the road approach. And what that means uh, is something that I will try and unpick during the course of this uh, talk. Uh, before I, I go any detail uh, further, I think the bit that I would like to highlight is the reason why we're doing uh, safe behavior definition is, is because ultimately what we want to achieve is trying to prove that automated driving systems are safe. And when you're trying to do that, there are only three things that you would need. You would need a set of scenarios. You would need a test environment to test the system, uh, scenario in. And, uh, and you'll need uh, a safety argument using the evidence that you have created. Irrespective of what technology you have, which ODD you have, you will only need these three things. 
and your environment could be a digital world, it could be driving simulator, it could be a test track, or it could be real world trials. That, that's less important. What is important is essentially you just need these three things. And what that means is when you go down one level down from that, is you need to somehow create those scenarios. So from a scenarios perspective, you need to create those scenarios, format those scenarios in a particular format and store them in a particular scenario catalog or a scenario database. And then once you've done that, then you need to plan and execute them in a particular test environment, be it simulation, test track or real world. And ultimately you will need to analyze and decide if that scenario is a pass or a fail which could be based on your functional requirements. It could be based on your driving policy. So irrespective of your organic driving systems, your ODDs, you will always, always have create, format, store, plan, execute, analyze, decide as your flow for proving that your organic driving systems are safe. The focus of today's talk is actually around the analyze and decide part of this flow. There's a lot of discussions that uh, we could do around the earlier stages, but because of the interest of time and the focus of this webinar, we're going to talk about analyze and decide. And within that, we're going to restrict ourselves from a driving policy perspective as to how do we prove or analyze and decide against the driving policy if we are doing the safe behavior or not. And that's the reason why the talk is around safe behavior, because we are, we are testing against safe behavior. Now, when you're testing against safe behavior, you need to somehow define what safe behavior is. So what's our motivation? So if you look at any re upcoming regulations or regulations that are being drafted right now or have already been drafted, be it the work at UNECFRAV, uh, DDT Workstream or ORU Workstream, which is Dynamic Driving Task or, or On-Road Users Workstream, or if you even look at the UNEC Reg 157, which is the uh, reg with the regulation with the automated lane keeping system, they all have statements like shall comply with traffic rules, shall be uh, sh uh, sh including compliance with traffic rules. And there's no way of actually verifying against this traffic rule in today's uh, uh, work processes. So what we're trying to achieve here is given that all our uh, future regulations and existing regulations for a, or higher levels of automation will always have a statement like this, like shall comply with traffic rules, which essentially is a way of saying that it's a good behavior to comply with traffic rules. We need to find out a way of me measuring against it. So when we do that, let's look at what rules of the road mean for human drivers. So if we look at the rules of the road and we have, for the UK uh, to start with. There are 307 rules of the road in the UK, which is called as the UK's highway code. If you look at each of those 307 rules, essentially they say one of two things. They're either saying that you're doing some behavior somewhere, or they're saying you're not doing some behavior somewhere. It's one of those things, nothing else. And Im importantly, doing or not doing could be construed as a behavior, something from, from a behavior competency library and somewhere could be construed as an instantiation of the ODD. So what we are now saying is a rule of the road is actually a function of your ODD and your behavior competencies. Now, this is not just random stuff. It's not a figment of imagination. So what we've done here is we've taken a rule of the road from the UK's highway code one, word to word. So what you see in front of you is the UK highway code rule 195 word to word. So it, it's about how you approach a zebra crossing as a human driver. So when you are as a human driver, you approach a zebra crossing and there's a pedestrian standing next to a zebra crossing, you slow down and you let the pedestrian cross. That's what we do. So if you look at this uh, rule, what it's saying here is everything in yellow, is a behavior, everything in blue is an ODD attribute. So zebra crossing is an ODD attribute, pedestrian is an ODD attribute. Approach, lookout, waiting to cross, slow, slow down or stop, these are all behaviors. So what we are saying here is that this rule is actually, I'm showing you is a function of behavior and ODD attributes. So the challenge here is that that's good to say that this is a function of behavior and already attributes, but it is something more also. And that's what we do as human drivers. We make assumptions 
the, uh, as human drivers for every rule. Now, if I ask you that we, if I tell you that we do make assumptions, even for that simple rule, you, you might say I might be joking, but here, here's, here's the thing. So nowhere in this rule does it mention how long should I be waiting at this zebra crossing as a human driver? That's an assumption that we make intuitively about how long to wait. But for an automated driving system, that needs to be explicitly mentioned in terms of how long should uh, the automated driving, uh, automated, automated driving system equipped vehicle should wait. So these are the kind of things that need to be translated into explicit numbers in, uh, in the rules to make them verifiable. So what we are saying here is, if you take current rules of the road for human drivers, be it the UK, be it Germany, be it Austria, France, US, Japan, China, anywhere, they will always, always be a function of operating conditions, as I've just highlighted, or ODD, a, a function of behavior competency and assumptions, as I've just highlighted. So what we need to do is we need to come up with a methodology where we take that as an input, apply a process that converts the codified rule of the road as a function of operating condition, behavior competency, and what we are calling as driving characteristics. So this could be waiting time at the zebra crossing. So this process of uh, changing uh, or converting the rules of road for human drivers to codified rules of road for automated vehicles is something that could be harmonized, could be standardized, could be regulated. But what we are saying here is it is essential that this process be created because without this, you will not be able to verify against that requirement of shall comply with traffic laws. Okay, so the important aspect over here is that we are not trying to redefine traffic laws as part of this work. So if you look at the way traffic laws are defined, if we, from a UNEC perspective, the traffic laws defi definition is generally part of WP1, which is one of the working parties within UNEC. The requirements for, uh, for automated driving systems are part of FRAV, and the testing side is part of BMAN. What we're saying is we take the input, uh, so the output of uh, WP1, which is the traffic laws, and we convert them into verifiable traffic laws, which can then be used by VMAT for testing against uh, that requirement. So that's what we're saying. So we're not defining, redefining the traffic laws. We are taking the ones as they are defined for human drivers and then converting them into something that is machine readable and, and verifiable for automated driving systems. So let's take an example over here. So how we are trying to do this. So this is an example from one of the UK highway code rules, that's rule 125. It talks about how you deal with speed limits uh, when you're traveling. So I don't want you to read the text. What I want you to focus on is the color coding. So what you see in front of you now is I have now taken this text and then extracted ODD information, extracted behavior information. At the same time, I have also extracted things that are problematic, things that are, are no longer relevant. So for example, uh, children and the word and is for an English uh, reader is, is fairly trivial. But if you convert this and into logic and, it has a very different meaning. So that actually is a problematic word used when we're actually trying to convert them into a uh, code, code that you can use for verification. So what we do is we ex extract the ODD attributes, the behavior attributes, identify the problematic words, and then ultimately what we do is we convert it into first order logic. So what you see in front of you is this rule in, in structured natural language converted into first order logic, which can then be verified against. So now we, this is a verifiable rule of the road that we can use as part of a safety assurance process. Now you might say that all this that you've done is very good for the UK, but how relevant is it for other countries? Does that even work for other countries? So what we've done is we tested it. There's only one way of trying it, uh, of knowing it, if is by trying it out. So what we've done is we've taken the Vienna Convention rules of the road. That is something everybody has to adhere to. And you look at the Vienna Convention and you look at Chapter Two of Part One, which it defines the rules of the road. So when we uh, did that, we took some of the rules. And we see it's, it's got the same issue 
of subjective interpretation or assumptions that we make as, as human drivers, like extra care does not cause inconvenience to road users. These are all things that we as human drivers make implicit assumptions, which will then be need to be explicitly mentioned for an automated driving system. Uh, again, a few examples of sufficiently speed low enough. Again, these are all subjective words which we decide but will need to be explicitly mentioned. So let's try and apply the approach that we've just mentioned or articulated on one of the rules from the Vienna Convention uh, document. So here's uh, rules of the road, article 11, overtaking bullet four. So this is defining how what you do when you're actually overtaking a, a vehicle. So it says when overtaking a driver shall give the road user or road users overtaken sufficiently wide berth. So what we can do from this is identify the behavior attributes like overtaking or overtaken, identify the ODD attributes, which is the in this case, the actor, road user and road users, and also identify what we call as qualifiers, like sufficiently wide. So this is what we call as a qualifier, which will then need to be explicitly mentioned. So what this would look like in terms of first order logic is something like this. Uh, for the mathematicians on the call would absolutely understand what this is. For those who, who don't, don't worry. What I'm trying to say is this is not verifiable and this is verifiable. That's the message I want to give you uh, give to you today. And that's what we need to do for all the rules of the road if we are actually serious about saying we will get this technology on road. And we will be confident that we are safe. So very similarly, here's another example, which is another bullet under the overtaking uh, article 11 and article overtaking aspect of the article 11 in the Vienna Convention document. Here you see behavior, overtake, over approaching, stop, speed. These are all behaviors that you can identify. Here we've got a few variety of ODD attributes like another vehicle, pedestrian crossing, carriageway, signposted crossing. These are all scenery elements of the ODD attributes. And then you've again got some qualifiers here, immediately low enough, immediately, which again, which will need to be explicitly mentioned. Now, once you've done all this, so what we've highlighted here is the approach of going from non-verifiable rules of the road for human drivers to verifiable rules of the road for automated driving systems is something that could be harmonized because it is very applicable, be it the UK Highway Code or UK Rules of the Road or the Vienna Convention Rules of the Road. It doesn't matter, the process still works. But how do we use this as part of the wider safety assurance process? So what, if you remember when I showed you the flow, I talked about this, we are going to focus on the driving policy or the analyze and decide. Let's try and zoom out a bit and look at the whole flow. So what you could do is, what we've just highlighted is the rules of the road, which is the driving policy against what you're testing is a function of behavior and ODD attributes. We already know, for those of you who are familiar with scenario-based testing, that scenarios are also a function of ODD and behavior attributes. So what we could do is we could map the rules of the road and the scenarios using these ODD and behavior tags. So now for every scenario, you know what your driving policy is because of the map between the ODD and behavior attributes. So that allows you to do the entire flow if you make the rules of the road verifiable using an ODD and behavior approach. And how the whole thing comes together is if somebody is, is developing an automated driving system and comes to me for approval process, as let's assume I'm a type approval authority or I'm working with a type approval authority and somebody comes to me and says, I have these ODD attributes, I have these behavior competencies for my uh, automated driving system, can you please approve that? So what I could do is I could look at the ODD attributes and behavior, search a query, a database like the safety pool scenario database, which has got lots and lots of scenarios based on ODD and behavior. So I will have all the relevant scenarios. I could also query the database to get the relevant rules of the road because they are also a function of ODD and behavior. And then I can make a case for completeness as to how you can uh, show that for this set of ODD attributes, you are confident that your system will always be compliant with traffic laws. You will always have safe behavior. So that's how the whole thing comes together by taking an ODD based approach to not only rules of the road, but also to your entire, entire safety assurance process. So in summary, what I'm going to talk to you, say, say to you today is 
every aspect of the safety assurance process for automated driving system needs to consider its relationship with our operational design domain. ODD is fundamental to the whole safety assurance process. I think we already know quite a bit around the relationship between ODD and scenarios. It's a well-established fact. But what I'm going to emphasize today is the safe behavior definition for automated driving system also needs to be a function of ODD. And that's how you can make that claim that for this set of scenarios in this ODD, I am compliant with all the uh, rules of the road. At the same time, while this all is philosophy and theory, we need some concrete tools and methods to, con uh, to convert this philosophical concepts into implementation. So we are doing a lot of work with various stakeholders in the UK and, and internationally on doing and creating those uh, tools and methods. And, and lastly, I would say that no one organization or no one country can on its own uh, realize the realize safe autonomy on its roads. We have to collaborate. Uh, without that, we're not going to achieve that. We've got, uh, I think, five or six speakers today and from very different nationalities, from very different uh, backgrounds. And, and that kind of knowledge sharing is needed if we are serious about uh, realizing this technology. Uh, that's all from my side. Uh, Bryn, over to you. Happy to take any questions. Amazing. That was really good, Sadafa. And thanks for being so short on the presentation. I know there's a lot of uh, additional work that's gone in in the background of that. Uh, and so uh, thanks for making it short and concise. Um, one of the ones I wanted to, to pick up on, you mentioned that the first rule to do with the overtaking, where when overtaking a driver shall give the road user or other or road users overtaken a sufficiently wide berth. I think that's quite a nice one that links back to what Will was presenting earlier about the sort of the UK's definition of 1.5 meters and a certain speed as being how they would specifically in on their roads classify sufficiently wide berth. Yes, it becomes exactly. the sort of qualifying parameter or the rule that can that that the UK could adopt. And I exactly I, exactly I, I, I reference that because I know that in the US, there are in some states references to something similar, but the distances might be different. You know, it might be three feet or it might yes. be three feet, but without a definition of speed that's attached to it. So, but the flexibility that you have in, in the encoding means that the, the threshold itself could be variable and exactly. that can be adapted to the ODD or adapted to the specific type of approval requirement for that exactly. state or country. And, and, and we feel that sufficiently wide might differ or will differ depending upon where you are in terms of ODD. Yeah, 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 and, and, and definitely in terms of conditions and the operating yeah. conditions. And as we saw earlier, the UK has a definition around other road users and then links the type of road user to the separation distance, the passing distance. You know, whether it's a horse or a pedestrian or a cyclist, those distances can be different. Um, and I think that's what's quite nice is that, and again, you know, the Convention on Road Traffic was designed to do that. It was designed to be that super set of rules that are generally applicable everywhere, but still allow domestic regulation to focus on the details of the implementation. And I think, you know, the process that you've come up with still allows that flexibility from what I see. Yeah. Super. Um, so I think there was, there was a question that was kind of related to that coming up from Russ, uh, Russ Shields, which was more about, you know, how do you, you know, de deal with the massive differences yes. in, in these rules? Um, so very briefly, I think the, the, the thing that we are saying is the process is something that we would uh, very much want people to use. The exact numbers would differ for different countries or different cultures. So I'm, I'm with Ru Russ over here in terms of there would be provincial variations. However, the methodology of coming, going from a non-verifiable to verifiable rules is something that could be uh, harmonized across countries, across pro provinces. So we're not saying there should be a single number for everybody. What we're saying is the method should, could be similar and we will need that because otherwise there's no way of proving that you are complying with traffic rules. Yeah, and, and what I really like about the approach is that You've used it in your work in the in the UK um, to feed into scenarios and defining scenarios, but then that's also possible to use a similar framework for in-use monitoring, where yes. effectively you are looking at those assumptions or those thresholds, and they become the things that you're monitoring against. Um, so I think that's that would be really good. Um, I just had a, a request um, from uh, Mike Mike Brazier. 
Mike, are you available to come to the floor? So Mike represents the, the DFT in the uh, UK. Mike, welcome. Hi, Brian. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to, um, well, th thank Will and Siddhartha as well for presenting. But um, I think there's another important point to the work that Siddhartha is doing that links into something Marcus was saying in his presentation, which is that what we want to do is try and bring to the surface all of those implicitness to things like rules and actually turn them into something explicit. So, so e even if there isn't a kind of single agreed number to some of these parameters, like passing distances, if we can make that kind of a bit more explicit, you can have a conversation around what those are. So, so even if the manufacturer themselves are defining it, at the very least, it allows to have that kind of open and verify that open conversation and, and makes it explicitly kind of verifiable. Excellent. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that, Mike. And, th and thanks for your contributions today and for arranging Jamie to speak earlier. And um, I just Thank wanted you, to just... For the comment also. Yeah, just open up the floor to our, our previous speakers. If there's any final comments that you would like to make, I've just noticed, you know, as the moderator, the time has just run out. But um, any of our previous speakers, uh, would you like to come to the floor and just uh, close with a final remark? I'm just, I'm just looking. It doesn't appear that they have a final remark. So that would leave it to me to say thank you very much for everybody who's contributed, both the presenters, and everybody in the chat and everybody asking questions. It's been a thoroughly engaging three hour conversation. Um, I really look forward to taking this work forward. Uh, we'll be doing so with the uh, ITU focus group meeting that's taking place tomorrow at one o'clock. And I think the, the details have been published by Stefano in the chat. Um, and with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much and hand you back over to Stefano right at the end. So thank you very much for attending everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brian, for having moderated. I helped also putting together this uh, AI for Good webinar uh, on in service monitoring and reporting uh, for automated driving safety. Uh, the, the webinar has been uh, really dynamic and interesting. And I'm sure all attendees uh, found it very informative. So a big thank you also to our panelists, as well as uh, all the participants for making it such an interesting discussion. And I'd like to invite uh, all of you to explore the work of the ITU focus group on AI for autonomous and assisted driving uh, and join uh, us for uh, its meeting that uh, will be tomorrow uh, from 13 to 16 uh, Geneva time uh, as of today. Uh, the focus group meetings are open to everyone. A separate registration is required and uh, you might contact us if you need any support You find information also on the chat. With that, uh, uh, we have reached the end of this webinar and uh, would once again uh, thank everyone involved, uh, our panelists, our participants, uh, our partners and sponsors, and uh, also the co-convener Switzerland of the i good uh, webinar series. This is Stefano Polidori from the ITU. Thank you very much and I hope to see you all again tomorrow.